This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Morning. It's three minutes after ten, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, for which for which I thank you. Um, I'm tempted to talk about trains today. I know that sounds a little bit North Norfolk Digital, but I, I, there's a one extraordinary piece in one newspaper, essentially describing. A thousand trains a day being cancelled, crumbling infrastructure, ageing carriages, data showing that in the 12 weeks from the 12th of November to the beginning of last month, an average of 1,062 trains a day were cancelled across England and Wales. I'm just giving you a heads up on something that might pop up a little later in the programme, because I find myself in the very odd position. I travel by train quite a lot, um, but it has changed for me. I only noticed this morning, because I'm due to travel by train tonight, this evening. I won't tell you where I'm going, because I would be inundated by autograph hunters if, if, if I did, and it would, be, it would add to the burdens of the guard to have to exercise some form of crowd control. Uh, but I don't think I travel by train in the same way that I did even five years ago, let alone 30 years ago, you'd tell your dad what time your train was getting in in the days before mobile phones, and your dad would be there to pick you up at the station, right? That's how it would work. I can't do that tonight. I cannot say to whoever might pick me up at uh, whatever station it is to which I'm going, I can't say I'll see you at half past eight or I'll see you at half past six. Because I, I, having travelled by train a lot this year and last year, I, I know that the likelihood of getting there at the time, advertised on the timetable, is, well, slim, or considerably slimmer than it ever was. I think we might have a look at that, but I need to find a slightly more exciting way of of dressing it up for you. We're going to begin with Theresa May. Wait a second, and I'll tell you why. We're going to begin with Theresa May, because when a Prime Minister, when a former Prime Minister leaves Parliament, it is a moment of historical importance, even if we are living through a period where we've had uh, so many prime ministers that it is genuinely hard to keep count. It's very well. I wish it was easier to forget Liz Truss, but it is quite easy to forget Liz Truss when you're going through in your head. What have we had? Have we had five? Because you include David Cameron. Cameron was there in 2016, so you include Cameron. Who followed Cameron? And then May, May, then Johnson, and then Sunak. Oh no, Truss. So yes, it is. There's five MPs in eight years. Five PMs. Forgive me. In eight years, absolutely extraordinary to uh, reflect upon what that tells us about the state of the party. And of course, because they're the party of government, it's what it tells us about the state of the country. Chaotic doesn't even come close, does it? And yet still in some polls, the Tories are hitting 20%. So I, I, I also, I mean, you know this by now, I, I, I suffer from what could be loosely described as the curse of the centrist dad. And by that I mean that my impulses are always to be nice, always to be kind, and always to be compassionate. I try to see the best in people, even when it leaves me humiliated and embarrassed. In the cases, for example, of of Matt Hancock, who I had warm words to say during some elements of, of, of lockdown. How, how wrong can a man be about a politician? Answer, listen to some of my comments about Matt Hancock back in the day. And, and he's not the only one. I, I, this, this, this strain, this psychic strain that I feel whenever we discuss public figures to, to just try to be... Not, I always suffer for... This is why I don't go to events. Have I ever told you this? I didn't even go to the Kebab Awards this year. And uh, the Kebab Awards has always been one of my favourite dates in the calendar. But the organisers always sit me next to, on top table, a senior Tory. And it means that the next time that senior Tory is in the news for, I don't know, um, expecting you to pick up the bill for their libel of, a, of, a, of an academic, then I, I feel my guns are spiked. I sat next to James Cleverly once on the one show sofa. And it meant that the next time James Cleverly was in the news for doing something dodge, I kind of felt a personal... I don't have that ability that some people in my line of work have to, to forget the personal when you wade in on the political. So I always, I always feel that my coverage of politics is polluted somewhat by personality i think well you're a, I, I, you might be listening oh i don't i don't have it with everyone i don't have it with boris johnson although i did for a while i certainly don't have it with liz truss but i've got it in spades with theresa may and i don't understand why i even tweeted this morning in an attempt to gird my own loins to resist 
the Theresa Billitation that I knew would be sweeping the airwaves by 10 o'clock this morning. Everybody everywhere saying, oh, well, you know, she wasn't that bad. Oh, she's not as bad as Boris Johnson. Nobody is as bad as Boris Johnson. There's a line in the film The Holdovers, which I have to tell you is quite, quite beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful film. I only saw it last night. But I'm going to give you a quick trigger warning here, and I'm not making light of anyone who suffers from this condition. But um, but but at the end of it, and I don't want to give you any spoilers. But but at the end of it, the, the sort of anti-hero says to his nemesis, he, he delivers one of the finest insults I've ever heard in my life. But I'm I'm giving you a trigger warning. He says you are penis cancer in human form. And I did find myself thinking just a moment ago. I did. My, you can't say Theresa May's all right. She's not as bad as Boris Johnson. It's tempting to say penis cancer is not as bad as Boris Johnson. I did. There is there is an absolute absolute horror show in place if you start saying people aren't that bad because they're not as bad as Boris Johnson. The moral of that story is, of course, that you really must go and see the holdovers. Oh, Sarah, please don't remind me that I was even quite nice about Rishi Sunak when he took over. And do you know why I was quite nice about Rishi Sunak when he took over? Do you know why? Because he wouldn't be as bad as Boris Johnson. Liz Truss, I don't think, I don't think I had anything warm to say about Liz Truss. But if I did, it would be because he wasn't as bad as Boris Johnson. So I think we need to be on guard today. I think we need to be on, t- on our toes. We need to be on tiptoes, don't we? To guard against excessive to rehabilitation. Excessive to rehabilitation. But my question for you will be whether or not there is room for some to rehabilitation, whether or not, in fact, comparisons like this are vaguely valid and do deserve a little bit of, I don't know what the word would be, um, recalibration. It is there. Well, and, and, and the way we do that is simple. We make it very, very personal. So I'm pretty confident that Theresa May was an awful prime minister. Off the top of my head, I give you the red lines which were uh, obscene and awful and absurd. The determination to pander to the racists who'd driven Brexit over the line by promising to abolish freedom of movement meant that we had to leave the customs union and the single market and even the sensible Brexiters. Even the sensible Brexiters had told us, the supposedly sensible Brexiters, had told us that the customs union and the single market were categorically not being taken off the table by leaving the European Union. And there we are. And there we are. Um... You also have Windrush, which to me was and remains a a, a, a hideously ugly scar on the um, on the national record. Eleven minutes after ten is the time, and for the third for the third one, well, I, I I don't know really whether you'd go for making Boris Johnson foreign secretary or whether you'd go for the way she treated the police when she was home secretary. You could now throw in the go home vans. You could throw in the response to Grenfell. There's all sorts of things you could cite. What would you cite as a positive, except for the fact that she wasn't as bad as Boris Johnson? I'm not going to mention that condition again, but um, I hope it now resonates, and and I hope it now throbs in the back of everybody's mind as a phrase that you will think of whenever the words, not as bad as Boris Johnson, is uttered. Twelve minutes after ten is the time. Let's make it personal, then. Let's make it personal. I say Theresa May, you say what? And I'm outlawing not as bad as Boris Johnson, or indeed not as bad as Liz Truss, or even not as bad as Rishi Sunak. I'm outlawing that. You can't have that today. That's off the table. But I do want to leave the door ajar for vaguely complimentary or positive contributions to the programme. I know it's hard for younger listeners to believe, but when a former Prime Minister leaves Parliament, it is a matter of moment. It is it is a significant event. And usually assembling a sort of political epitaph would be de rigueur. It would be completely normal. It feels weird now, doesn't it? Not least because we've seen one former Prime Minister leave the House of Commons since Theresa May was Prime Minister. One of her successors walked the plank. But I am open to the suggestion. I am, I am categorically open to the uh, contention that she wasn't all bad. But I also really want your help today, reminding everybody listening why the, the, 
uh, to rehabilitation. You can tell I'm pleased with having come up with that word, can't you? Because I'm using it so much. Why, why the to rehabilitation? It needs to be at the very least challenged and at the most furiously resisted. Okay, so let's get the phone lines open. Theresa May, what did and does she mean to you? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Good God, there's so much I'd forgotten. Don't forget, says Sarah, she was the first to fly to America when Trump was elected and was filmed holding his hand. I, I again, this is ah, it's, oh, this is awful. Is it? Is it a sort of benign misogyny? Is it because she's a woman and I was raised to be? respectful of women in a way that I wasn't raised to be respectful of men? Is it because she's a woman that I find myself feeling, uh, I call it benign misogyny, benign sexism, sort of protective. So I want to say no one forced her to hold Don. If Donald Trump came to hold your hand and pulling it away would cause a diplomatic incident, would you not leave your hand in Donald Trump's orange paw? I don't know, but again, I mean, you say that, you cite that as an example of reasons not to like her, and I start feeling sorry if that's what we're doing today. We got there in the end. We got there quite early, actually, by my standards. Remind me why I should not be feeling sorry for Theresa May today. Oh, three, four, five, six. Ah, oh, it's the cough. It's the blooming cough. Do you remember the cough? Uh, even before the letters started falling off the backdrop, that's when you thought that you were witnessing some sort of supreme meta parody and that they were going to like the, the, the it would be like on saturday night takeaway when the when the celebrity doesn't know he's about to appear i don't know how they do that by the way it was chesney hawks on the last week's or the weeks but how on earth does chesney hawks end up in what he thinks is a safety deposit box room without realizing that he's been brought in backstage at a massive tv studio or theater so that when the walls of the safety deposit box fall down he's on stage with anton deck in in a massive tv studio or theater i honestly don't know but when the when the letters started falling off the wall behind theresa may that's when you honestly thought that you were witnessing some sort of politics meets performance art moment and it must be deliberate it can't it can't have gone this badly without it being planned in advance was that the same one the p45 one so the letters fell off the wall she couldn't stop coughing and then a comedian jumped on stage and tried to give her a p45 all in one conference speech you'd have to be made of butter not to feel sorry for her at that point and she came on dancing and you sort of think of your mum's friend don't you she came on doing the Abba thing and you thought, oh, bless you. And then you remember the go-home vans and the host. It was Michael Mac. No, it wasn't. It was, oh, I don't know. Was it Michael McIntyre? Not, not Anson Tech. Oh, oh, God. This, I'm so confused. Remind me why I shouldn't be. Michael McIntyre, not Anson Deck. I'm sorry. The star of the show show or something. I don't know. It all blurs into one when you're my age. I'll be talking about the generation game next. Remind me why. Remind me why we should not feel sorry for Theresa May. And remind me why her legacy should actually be pungent as opposed to polite. Because the benefit of being followed by the worst three conservative prime ministers, the worst three prime ministers in living memory, Johnson, Truss, Sunak, should not be allowed to overshadow the fact that with the possible exception of David Cameron, she is, she would have been the worst prime minister in living memory so what is it for you she triggered article 50 says owen in liverpool she did this is going to be a long hour what have i forgotten what are you going to put on the list and and do it in person ring in as well oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three when i say to you that i can feel myself oh god i can feel <laughs> forming inside me like a kind of succubus or an alien I feel like Sigourney Weaver. There's an alien inside me that is feeling sorry for Theresa May and thinking things like, well, she wasn't as bad as Boris Johnson. Please, cure me. Cure me. That's today's challenge. Remind me why we shouldn't be feeling for Theresa May. But because I'm such a balanced and nice person, I have to now add in parentheses, you can ring in with positives. 0345 6060 James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
20 minutes after 10 is the time. Oscar says, I really need this today, James. May is the only one I ever feel sorry for after that conference speech, the way that Boris Johnson was with her too, and the little cry at the end when she resigned. She reminds me of one of my grandma's friends. And then I remember the other stuff, like the go-home vans. Today, this programme is dedicated to resisting the Theresa Billitation that is sweeping the rest of the nation. Mark's in Mill Hill. Mark, help me out. I'm not going to. What? Uh, no, uh, it's... Um uh, firstly, I'm not going to put you out of your misery because you have teenage daughters and you have to live through all of that. And my first point about Theresa May was, and this is the minor one, sending Amber Rudd in to bat for her during the 2017 general election. What did she do? Remind me why this, I mean... I, th- this is when it was a TV debate. I think it was ITV and... Uh, she uh, she wouldn't go up against Corbyn herself. She sent Amber Rudd in to do it okay. for her. I mean, it's not. That's I mean, in a great charge sheet of things she did wrong. I don't. I'm, I'm surprised you okay, put that well, one at the top. That, that's just my. That's just my my entry. Yeah. My actual my actual lead item is she's the leader of the first government to be found in contempt of Parliament. Uh, in 2018. For what was not, that for? What was that? That about? was not publishing the government's legal advice. Um, this is huge. Jeffrey Cox um, um, regarding. And are you sure Brexit. that was the very first time that the government was found to be in contact yep, with Parliament? Absolutely. December the 4th, 2018. Um, you know, Brexit's boiled all our brains, hasn't it, mate? Because, you know, the idea that she couldn't republish the actual legal advice that they'd received because to do so would have alienated her own party, I presume that's the reason, led her to go down the path of contempt instead. This yeah. is Geoffrey Cox, the Attorney General. Yeah, looking like the Cheshire cat that he always yeah. does on the front bench. Um, and then uh, uh, Keir Starmer... Asking, um, no, it's on the John list, mate. It's, it's going to be a long list, and you, you've kicked things off. 23 after 10 is the time. Alex is in Manchester. Alex, what have you got? Hi, I'm, I'm kind of in a similar position to you, James. Well, maybe. But, but you mean you're, you're cursed with excessive niceness, Alex? A little. Yeah. She obviously did some bad stuff. There's Windrush um, uh, as a prime example, um, and kind of where we ended up with Brexit. And where we ended up with Brexit is a classic example of it's really hard with Theresa May to pinpoint what she stood for. Where was her conviction? Because she was trying to please everybody with Brexit. And in a way, I, I think she was trying to find a solution that worked for the country because it was ever so close. And she had remained in her heart, but she was trying to please, you know, make sure it worked for the Brexiteers. You and are ended a bit up like me, because what you're saying is she had an impossible task. She knew that her job was to limit the damage that Brexit would do. She knew that she couldn't say that out loud because all of the headbangers like Rhys Mogg and Francois would have a fit of the vapours and the opportunist in chief, Boris Johnson, was waiting in the wings to start flogging snake oil on an industrial scale. So she did do that job with a sense of duty, is what you're reminding me Yeah, you can tell when she left she said you know it's the country that she loved and she choked up and you know she was trying to do the best but we reached an impasse because she didn't have the conviction it's like the, the robot dancing you, you either throw yourself into the dancing or you don't and it ends up being awkward when you can't quite yeah but, get it I, right. but i mean some people can't throw themselves into the dancing even if they'd want to and they <laughs> i you know they're, they're just not possessed of that that level of of of, of looseness that level no. of and dis- she's disassociation She's very on the detail, isn't she? she? You know, she she was the one who halted the nuclear deal with China, which um, Cameron and Osborne had lined up to all go a- ahead. Mm-hmm. It was her that looked and wanted to scrutinise that because of security issues. So she she was always trying to do the right thing, and you know. And, and then uh, you know, people are shouting "Go home, vans!" Hostile environment, citizens of nowhere. So I, 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 any any good that she did will, for many of us, and even if you leave Brexit out of it, because she deserves a much more nuanced analysis than any of the others since than than mm-hmm. on that one issue for the reasons that you've articulated perfectly so if you leave brexit out of it anything you cite as a positive is surely going to be undone by the pandering 
to the to the to the forces that have now taken over the Tory party. She she I think she rolled out a form of red carpet for the likes of 30p Lee and Jonathan Gullis when she started talking about hostile environments and citizens of nowhere and those mm-hmm. it, those hideous go home vans. That she she made yeah. the party nasty again and I think she was the one that originally said we've got to stop being the nasty party. Yeah, but it didn't, it didn't end up very, being very strong and stable anyway. Um, strong and stable, there you go. We should have a sound <laughs> effect for that. I'd forgotten. Strong and stable. All right, an extra prize, an extra point. Can you remember the Daily Mail front page that greeted her um, her arrival in Downing Street? Oh, no, no idea. Are you ready for this? I've got a yeah. memory. I wish I could wash my memory sometimes, Alex. I wish you could get memory bleach. Steel of the new Iron Lady. Ooh. The steel um, she, of the she, new Iron Lady. Another legacy. I remember her bringing Liz Truss in. So when she became Prime Minister, I remember Liz Truss coming out of one of the taxis at number 10 and being appointed to the Cabinet. Oh, um, so that she also laid the carpet for that. put that on the list as well. So I, I think there is a sort of consensus emerging in that she was nowhere near as objectively awful as what followed. But if we forget about what followed, she'd be awful. And that's quite a tricky thing to negotiate. That's why, that's, why, that's why being a historian is a nuanced and complicated business. Alex, thank you. Thank you also for reminding me of that front page. The steel of the new Iron Lady. Quite extraordinary. And I have to tell you that there is a front page on a national newspaper today, not the same one. There is a front page on a national newspaper today that I think, hand on heart, if you haven't seen it yet, I think it's even more bonkers than the Daily Mail front pages during the during the Brexit heyday. You remember them? You, you, so you've got the steel of the new Iron Lady. Then you've got, not even the Brexit, you've got the Liz Truss one. Finally, a true Tory budget. That was just before Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng set fire to our entire economy. You remember the, the really ugly ones? Uh, 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 crush the saboteurs. You remember that one? Crush the saboteurs. Enemies of the people, talking about our independent judiciary. I think there's a front page on a national newspaper today that is, and it's Brexit related, and this, of course, is the home of Brexit reality. This program, uh, since 2016, has become synonymous with being proved right about Brexit. I think that today's front page is the most bonkers Brexit front page ever. Think, but just think about that for a minute. All right, I'll tell you what it is before. I'll tell you what it is after the next news bulletin, actually. But can you believe that I'm sitting here seriously contending that we have the most bonkers Brexit front page ever in front of us? And I'll give you a little clue. It features someone who is likely to be, as things stand, the next leader of the Conservative Party. Ken's in Leeds to steer us back to the resisting the Theresa habilitation. What would you like to say, Ken? Morning, James. Hello, Great Ken. fun. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it, it was a throwaway remark uh, which just encapsulated for me the personality of the woman. A nurse during one of the um, open forum events uh, asked about the conditions in the NHS and pay for nurses. And Theresa May's response to that was there is no such thing as a magic money tree. That just for me. It's illustrated the contempt that that woman had. It, 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 for if, if memory serves, the nurse, the nurse hadn't had a pay rise for the best part of a decade, had she? Uh, exactly so. And uh, it, it just, it was a careless thing, and I think she thought it was a, a good answer. Yeah. And it just highlighted how uncaring that woman was. It, well, and, particularly and I will as, never as, believe anything else. No, and, and Home Secretary under David Cameron as well. So the... Um, <laughs> idea that she you know that the austerity signing up full-throated for austerity and then telling a nurse who hadn't had a pay rise for eight years that there wasn't a sort of magic money tree that we can shake that suddenly provides for everything that people want you're right i, I mean wh- why do yeah. you think or maybe you suffer from what i suffer from which i'm going to loosely call a form of benign sexism is that i i i, I don't i don't i can't I almost struggle to go in studs up on a female politician in the way that I would on a male politician. Do you suffer from that at all? Do we need to, no, do we need to remind James, ourselves no, to be equal? I, I am, I'm very <laughs> conscious of the inequality that we have these days. Yes. And, you know, women have a real hill to climb. That's very but true. No, I think, uh, I think it's about personality and ability. Yeah. When you get to the level of prime minister, yeah. uh, I think we're past that. Uh, and you've got to look at a person's, um, you know, what, what, 
what their personality and character is. And uh, <laughs> I'm afraid hers was quite contemptuous. Uh, well, I, that's a lovely word, contemptuous, in this context. To, to say that to a nurse, I, I, you know, you could even have been a bit more mealy-mouthed and less offensive. You know, we simply can't afford. But to patronise her by saying there's no magic money tree. If there is no magic money tree, Theresa May, where did Michelle Donnellan get that 15 grand to settle a libel case after she maligned an independent academic in one of the worst worst ways imaginable? There's a question for the ages. Thank you, Ken. A couple of phone lines free now. Don't text me to complain that you can't get through. 0345 6060 is the number that you need. Nazir Afzal, great friend of the programme, former chief prosecutor, of course, up in the northwest. He reminds us that she did agree to criminalise forced marriage, stalking and modern slavery. I saw her listen to victims and act. So there is room here for a little bit of light to rehabilitation. But Nazir adds, there are many good reasons to attack her, not least her hostile environment. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. I should have done one of those ABCs that you love so much, shouldn't I? I should have made up two front pages that are bonkers and, and included the one that I think is the most bonkers Brexit front page I've ever seen. Considering it's 2024 and the whole world knows that Brexit's a disaster, this, this, this assumes almost, I, I, I don't want even the word, this assumes preternatural levels of bonkersness. It is, it is it's, I, I mean, it's almost admirable in its detachment from reality. Uh, Just before we get back onto Theresa May, remember something I told you a while ago about how Liz Truss became leader of the Conservative Party. Liz Truss did something which is still not fully understood by the, well, certainly by the client media, but, but possibly by the broader electorate as well. Liz Truss watched Boris Johnson lying, okay, and she found inspiration. Most people watched Boris Johnson lying and had one of three reactions. They, like me and probably you, felt complete disgust or they felt complete befuddlement at how somebody could get away with this or they felt a sort of mild guilt at being part of the process but believing it was justified because the end always justifies the means. So that would be Dominic Cummings, for example. So Dominic Cummings, like a lot of Tories who presumably like to see themselves as sensible, Dominic Cummings would have thought, well, Boris Johnson's absolutely awful, but he is the engine that we need. He is the vessel that we need to be aboard in order to achieve our other goals. So those are the three reactions to, to Boris Johnson. Number one, disgust. Number two, befuddlement. Number three, he's awful, but the end justifies the means. Liz Truss watched Boris Johnson, and she felt inspired. She watched Boris Johnson lie about everything. Uh, remember that the deal that he put through, Tom Swarbrick reminded Nick Ferrari of this earlier today. The deal that, that, to, that Boris Johnson finally signed with the European Union contained several elements that he had said when Theresa May was Prime Minister he would be utterly unable to countenance or support. The level of political fraudulence required to do that is beyond most of our ken. And yet Liz Truss watched that and felt inspired. She watched these lies land and she watched Boris Johnson's popularity grow even as she knew he was lying And instead of feeling disgust or befuddlement or the end justifies the means, Liz Truss found herself thinking, I wonder whether I can do that. I wonder whether I can, I wonder whether I, and that's when she started making claims about non-existent trade deals or trade deals that were either equivalent or inferior to what we had before. That's when she started making claims that were designed to appeal exclusively to truth-denying tabloid newspapers and the Conservative Party membership. So Liz Truss's popularity among Conservative Party members started rising in almost direct correlation to the lies she was telling about Brexit. She was the only politician really claiming benefits, claiming victories in what appeared at first glance to be a substantive sense. And her inspiration for that came from watching Boris Johnson lie about everything from uh, uh, the Irish Sea border right through to oven readiness. And what's happening now, which is extraordinary, is that a politician called Kemi Badenoch is 
watching Liz Truss and her path to power and taking notes. So you would have thought, wouldn't you, in any sensible universe, Liz Truss would be a deterrent. Liz Truss would be a warning sign. Liz Truss would be the poster girl for how not to do politics. But if you are driven entirely by ambition, and integrity is a word you struggle even to spell, then you look at Liz Truss and you think one thing. Well, she got through the door. She got into Downing Street. And if you care more about getting into Downing Street than you do about your constituents, your country, your party, or anything under the sun, you could conceivably watch Liz Truss and think, I'm going to have a bit of that. So just as Liz Truss watched Boris Johnson and his disastrous political trajectory, so Kemi Badenoch watches Liz Truss's even more disastrous political trajectory and feels inspired. And that's how you end up with the most bonkers front page I have ever seen. James O. Brexit has never seen a Brexit front page as bonkers as this. Are you ready for it? I'm just going to clear my throat before I do this, actually. Excuse me for one moment. Here it is. We got a sound effect? Have we got a, t a trumpet or anything? No, nothing? Oh, it's all right. I'll do it myself. Here is the most bonkers front page in the... What? In the history of Brexit. Are you ready for this? Yeah, go on. Have a sound effect. Unhinged headline. I completely forgot. We had an unhinged headline sound effect. Where did that come from? Was that another feature that I came up with and then forgot about the next day, even though we got our own stuff? Can we do that again? Because it sounds great. And now, here it is. Not only the most bonkers Brexit front page of all time, but arguably the most unhinged headline. Unhinged headline. I haven't read it out yet, have I? I'm just doing it all for the YouTube viewers. Ready? Brexit is a great British success story worth billions. Brexit has reignited the UK's trade standing in global markets worth hundreds of billions of pounds, says Kemi Badenoch. So there it is. The most bonkers Brexit front page the world has ever seen. And you've actually reminded me now where that unhinged headline idea came from. That was the Daily Telegraph's comment pages, wasn't it? So I'm going to see if I can find... Why did no one remind me, Keith? Why did no one remind me about doing the unhinged headline feature? What was what was what was the other one? What other what other features have we got that we've forgotten to do lately? Woke watch. Woke watch. Thank you. Unhinged headline. Um, and what was the other one? What's the most recent one? We've done a smear kit. Smear kit. These are all brilliant ideas. This is radio. Go. No one. Thank you. Thank. You. No wonder we're nominated for the British Broadcasting Guild Press Guild something best radio program in the world something award nomination. Some. No. What? This is genius. This stuff. And you all forget about it. I can't come up with the ideas and implement the ideas and remember the ideas. Someone else has to do the remembering. And today, of course, we are remembering why it would be a mistake. A grave mistake to join the Theresa Billitation of the former Prime Minister, who has announced this morning that she is quitting Parliament. And again, to give credit where credit's due, she gave the story to the Maidenhead advertiser. Diana's in Banbury. Diana, I bet you've forgotten why you rang in, but try to remember if you can. <laughs> Hi, James. Hello, Diana. I do, I do remember. It was about whether or not to feel sorry for Theresa May. Yes. I was. Uh, labeled yellow jacket woman on question time in 2017 when I was in the audience and um, there was a good deal of do we feel sorry for Theresa May and even Emily Thornbury said that she felt sorry for Theresa May I stuck my hand up and Fiona Bruce it was her first um, show oh yes um, uh, said the woman in the yellow jacket Fantastic. and I said could we get over could we get over feeling sorry for Theresa May God you and were ahead said, of the curve you were ahead she of the said, curve weren't you oh, yeah. she said she said hang on hang on do you never feel sorry for Theresa May and I said no I don't and I gave a 90 second explanation as to why I didn't and it went viral on uh, YouTube it got three million views Crikey. it was in every single newspaper Daily Mail Evening Standard Times. I'm looking at it now. Times. It was in German, Der Spiegel, 
And uh, you were, I, you, were, you I, were widely hailed as the finest audience contributor in the history of Question Time, Diana. There we go. There we go. Happy um, days. It was, it, it was quite extraordinary, but because I really felt angry because I'd done a great deal of campaigning to try to prevent Brexit happening, and I could see what was going to happen. I published a piece in The Times three weeks before the referendum saying this is going to go the wrong way because I'd talked to so many people in the street uh, all over the place. And Theresa May started this whole slide. I mean, what I said in that 90 seconds was she started the hostile environment, yes. which was not only horrid, but failed. She drew all the red lines that made it impossible to negotiate with the EU. She failed to understand that the EU was held together by a body of rules and regulations and that, and that the way she was approaching it was hopeless. She was the one who had a fixation about what she always called the European Court. It was actually the Human Rights Court. So you're China, right, yeah. Which, yes. which is not the European Court, because she'd messed up trying to um, get rid of a, a, of a terrorist and she'd missed the deadline. Yeah, but what would so, you yeah, know about that? You're, what would you know about that as a former litigation and investigations lawyer who also worked uh, as a Crown it. Court judge? <laughs> Thank you. In any event, uh, at the time, they, it, I, I mean, I felt that Theresa May was marking what was going to be a slippery slope. I yes. have to say, I never thought it would be quite as massive a slippery slope as we've been on. But, you know, she tried to sort things out by making uh, Boris Johnson her foreign secretary and yes. we saw what happened there. Yeah, that went well. Um, and, and, I mean, she just started this whole process. She opened the door for what was going to happen next. And every time each of them opens the door for someone who does even worse and That's tells exactly. even more lies. Like a Russian doll of ridiculous, a Russian it's, doll of awfulness, isn't it? It's so depressing. It really is. Did you enjoy your celebrity, your brief celebrity? <laughs> well, it was a bit alarming because I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, the Daily Mail was saying I ought to be the new pri next prime minister. But I thought the thing to do was go on holiday and get away from it, uh, so yes. I did. But that, I, no, I very... do have an Instagram that's called Yellow Jacket Woman, this which is... I have to say, since it's become X, I've stopped posting on. No, of course. It. No, but this is... I, I'm going to dig out that speech, actually, and remind people of it. Because, I, I mean, the, 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 well, actually, I can ask you... Forgive me for using this phrase, but as, as, as a woman, I can ask you whether or not you recognise the... I think, do you get... Does, do, I, think, I think Diana gets a Ray Liotta, doesn't she, Keith? Don't you think? I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. We're, we're having a conversation about whether or not we should feel sorry for Theresa May and the yellow jacket woman who went truly viral four years ago, more, five years ago. Oh, but, uh, yeah. It was, 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 yeah, okay, I think, and, and actually the, the public have spoken. There's a Ray Liotta on the way. But is, is, do you understand what I mean when I say, as a bloke, that I find it a little bit hard to go in with my studs up on Theresa May in a way that I simply don't suffer from with Boris Johnson, for example? And you well, didn't. You didn't I suffer mean, from that problem at all. Clearly, I, uh, I. I mean, I can see looking back, Theresa May was, you know, had a level of integrity that uh, has not been repeated since. But actually, she just got it wrong. She yes. got it badly, um, that's, badly that's wrong. She put party. Put. She put party before country. She had this fixation about hostile environment for I immigrants. She start. She started this entire ball rolling. And and she let women down, is all I can say. I can't say fairer than that, and it certainly earns you one of these. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Feature. If you build it, they will come. Diana Good, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, James. Always enjoyed your show. Thanks. Thanks. Lovely Bye. to hear. It's 10.47. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.51 is the time. Are you kidding me? I feel, I've only just drawn breath. So I, and I feel my list is barely even started. I probably spent too long playing all our old sound effects for features that I've forgotten about, even though they were brilliant ideas at the time. Keith, can we start a feature on features I've forgotten about, even though they were brilliant ideas at the time, please? Can we get a, like a, like a zoom? Features that were brilliant ideas, even though I've forgotten about them and they were brilliant ideas at the time or something. Zoom! Like that, no? Oh, all right then. Be like that. So I haven't even started putting my list together. Hostile environment is obvious, but I, I'd forgotten about... I mean, this is a really good point, actually. Uh, 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 David Hellier taking things uh, a little more seriously, perhaps, than, than we have been doing so far, which is a mistake. Although Diana uh, obviously reminded us how seriously she was taking this question of feeling sorry for Theresa May as long ago as 2019, and we will, I think, remind ourselves of that 
uh, famous question time, truly famous question time contribution shortly. But but Dave puts it like this from Nuneaton. Uh, love the show. Thank you. May was bad because she was weak. When she had that 48-52 divide, she made no attempt to find a solution other than the one that the populist right wanted. It was her attempt to control them, yes, but once they overwhelmed her, she was swept aside, finding herself... Um, uh, uh, watching as parliamentary standards crumbled. All right, here it comes, Dave. That's it, mate. That is why I do have a scintilla of sympathy for Theresa May. Because she thought, as a lot of people have thought over the years, she thought that you could sate that appetite. She, she thought, because of who she is, for all of the faults that we're listing and will continue to list, she thought that there must be, at the root of this, there must be a semblance of rationality. So there must come a point where facts will trump feelings, where policy will be more important than performative posturing. Policy will be more, infor- more important than posturing. But reality will trump rhetoric. So, so that's why she did the things that she did, because she thought, if I can keep these people on a leash, then they won't tear us all to shreds, either the party or the country or each other. And of course, because you're dealing with something built on lies and emotion... You couldn't. It was never going to reach the roots of rationalism. So she did all of these things to try to keep it sweet, to try to keep Johnson at bay, to try to keep the... I'm I'm sorry, I don't have the words anymore to describe the idiocy, the dangerous, delinquent, nation-damaging idiocy of people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and the rest of them, Nadine Dorries. Um, she, She thought that you could somehow satiate them when, of course, their appetites were insatiable because they were built upon prejudice and rhetoric and feeling and emotion. So that's how I can kind of feel sorry for her. Uh, Alex in Leicester. Alex, what would you like to say? I, I think you've nailed it on the head from my point of view, but I think you've been really harsh. I think a couple of callers have been really harsh on her. She came in a position of going to do a job when she was up... You look at who she was up against when she was in the election. She was up against Ledsom, Go. And Fox. Yeah, that's true. She, so she knew that she knew the danger. There was no one else. Everyone else was looking around the room, going, "Who wants the job?" No one wanted the job, apart from the really strong Brexiters, and she knew what that meant for the party. Okay, <sighs> they've dragged out a little bit longer than necessary. Yeah, but you so see, her whole role was duty. Honestly, her whole role was. Oh, duty. you're a good man, Alec. You really are, and 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 I don't think you're wrong necessarily, but you can't avoid the fact that it couldn't have gone worse. Even from the perspective of what she was trying to prevent happening, it happened. How, yeah, how worse thing is she came out and went, Brexit means Brexit, oh. and so she's, she's stuck. As soon as she came out and said that, the Brexiteers were great, because oh, yeah, we got her on side. And the the sta- no that was what got us the steal of the new Iron Lady front page, I think. I think it was the Brexit means Brexit moment. So the Brexit means Brexit, and then the red lines... And then the citizens of nowhere. Do you remember that? Which was a real lump of red meat for the for the jingoistic or the xenophobic um, wing of the party. And also, remember her cabinet was falling apart. I think she had eight, nine resignations inside two years. So you're so, you're managing objectivity here, I think, properly, aren't you? And you're saying you, you you know she might be awful in many many ways, but this is the task that she set and accepted. This is the challenge she accepted, and that and that alone is worthy of respect. Yeah, the challenge of that it was a party she knew wh- where it was going. I think she did her best to turn it, but she knew she couldn't get a deal, a Brexit deal that would suffice the Brexiteers. And don't forget, she was looking from a point of view of this is what the country's voted for, I need to do damage limitation. She was a damage limitation prime minister. A damage limitation prime minister who could never say out loud that what she was presiding over was damaging. Yeah, because if then her home party would... Because she had to say it's a brilliant idea, I can't believe I voted. I I mean, what she did, trust then took and times by a thousand, didn't she? Yeah, and she never believed in any of them. You kind of look at the work she's done in Parliament at the moment where I think... Boris Johnson made his speech and she kind of said it's an awful decision and it's not the Brexit we should be voting for. I, yeah, I mean, this is a voice of reason. I, it doesn't cancel out all of the stuff on the other side of the scales by any stretch of the imagination, but this is where my... I mean, on an emotional level, the scintilla of sympathy that I feel comes from physical moments. It comes from the dancing on the stage. It comes from the cough, which I oddly, as a tribute to Theresa May, I'm suffering from a bit of a cough today. I don't know whether you've noticed. 
I, I need one of those Jakeman's cherry menthol drops. They're quite nice. But I can't eat that on the... I, sorry, this doesn't matter, does it, in the great scheme of things? So this is my little tribute to Theresa May. I have a little cough today. That makes you feel sorry for her. The stuff falling off the, off the back of the thing makes you feel sorry for her. But we have been reminded by Yellow Jacket Woman, star of Question Time in 2019, we have been reminded in glorious fashion why we should not feel sorry for her. And I think the quality of Alex's call demands that we remind ourselves once again why we should not feel sorry for Theresa May. The woman in the Yellow Jacket... Um, two things. Uh, firstly, could we get over feeling sorry for Theresa May? Um, uh, it's, Do you never feel it's, sorry for her? It's, it's not... Hang to, on, hang it, on. Do you never feel sorry for her? No, I don't feel sorry for her. She's the woman who, for many, many years, has led uh, the hostile environment uh, for migrants in this country, which resulted in the Windrush generation. It's a disgrace. She's the person who created her very specific red lines on immigration in the ECJ, which have created the negotiation mess that we're in. She triggered Article 50 when she had no plan. And as to criticising the EU on this, there are 27 other countries in the EU. They have been completely united on this. We do not even have a cabinet that can unite, and definitely a government that isn't in control of the process. They are a body of rules and regulations, and they are not going to break that when it's the most successful um, single market in the world and and all around the world, people want to do deals with the EU. We are going to lose all of that. And it is ridiculous for us, with our hopeless government, who cannot get it together, to actually work out what the will of the people is today, in 2019, um, to blame the EU and to go around feeling sorry for Theresa May. I'm sorry. Listen to that. Round of applause. And now she got a Ray Liotta as well. But good Lord, has one contribution to Question Time ever secured so many plaudits? Um, Brickbats, I, I very much doubt it. I, I, I don't know. Let's see what we feel like after the news, shall we? Because at the moment, I don't think we've come up with Theresa May's biggest disaster or, her, or, or the worst thing that she did. We could get a little bit more nuanced on this and look at that challenge, that difficulty of trying to deliver. Um, what it was that she charged herself with trying to deliver. But other stories that I'm drawn to include a collapse, I believe genuinely, of the railway system. And I really like that story that Sheila talked about yesterday. Uh, the school checking on whether or not pupils have actually gone on holiday when they're claiming that they're off sick. And how far could a school reasonably go without, without upsetting you? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is three minutes after 11. Um, that didn't go in quite the way I wanted it to go. Well, I loved the way it went, but it wasn't the way I intended it to go. It was all quite knockabout, wasn't it, that analysis of Theresa May's legacy. I, I want now to move you into slightly more personal and detailed territory. So not the, not the overviews, not, not the, um, if you like, the, the retrospective analyses of her performance as a politician, which I think we did a cracking job of pinning down. But I want instead to look at some of the individual instances of her legacy. I want particularly to hear from you if you were affected by the things that she did. So a police officer, do you remember the police officer who stood up at the Police Federation conference and told her in terms that the policies she was pursuing were going to damage community policing? And by community policing, he meant the practice of officers being on streets in communities, finding out if there were concerns about Dirty Gertie at number 30 or if they were worried that there may be some young people um, showing signs of radicalization at number 74 and all, all of those things he cited. He had been community policeman of the year and I just want to make this distinction. I'm not sure it's necessary, but it might be. A, a distinction between, because I say community policing and you might think of a police community support officer, a PCSO. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about full, full fat coppers whose job was to police communities and not from a, 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 an exclusively stick perspective, but also from a carrot one to get to know communities. And he stood up at the Police Federation Conference. I used to play this clip all the time because I thought it was really important. Although I guess I am the Cassandra of, of current affairs in this country. I, I keep telling you about what's going to happen if you don't change course and we crack on and do it anyway. So 
he, he, he literally gave a speech at the Police Federation Conference warning about what was going to happen. He was, I think, he, was he not announcing that he was leaving the force? He'd been community police, community police officer of the year a couple of years previously. I think we spoke to him on the program. It's hard to remember what was going on, wasn't it, before the madness of 2016 kicked in and boiled all our brains. And, and then, of course, it emerged that the Manchester Arena bomber a terrorist who, 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 who blew up that concert at the Manchester Arena had been in the neighbouring borough. So he literally warned about the dangers of cutting community policing while she was giving speeches telling coppers to stop crying wolf. And I, 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 in a grim coincidence, the community ad adjacent to the one that this officer used to look after was the one in which that, um, that, that Manchester bomber hailed from. I think it was the one next door. Joe, Joe's been in touch to say, wasn't it the same beat where the Manchester Arena bomber came from? I, memory serves, Joe. It was it was adjacent, very much the same area, but not quite the same beat. So you have that. I had a couple of messages on social media this morning from people, one, one in particular caught my eye, from someone whose grandmother was nearly deported as a consequence of Windrush. Uh, I, I, I think that that had Theresa May's fingerprints all over it. If you're ready to talk about this, and you can, what was it like when she failed to turn up at Grenfell in the first instance? Do you remember? She, she, she wasn't there. She wasn't there. Uh, uh, one of the, I think still for me, one of the most incomprehensible collisions between political and personal that we've ever witnessed. I will never forget taking calls in the immediate aftermath of the Grenfell Tower tragedy from people who didn't know where to go people whose homes had been destroyed, whose families had been thrown into complete disarray, who had, of course, quite possibly lost family members. And it was local communities, churches and mosques in particular, that essentially dealt with much of the aftermath. Uh, Kensington and Chelsea Council, absent in many ways. And when national government was afforded an opportunity to step into the vacuum to step into the vacuum of leadership that had been left by the local council, it took Theresa May, if memory serves, several days even to turn up at Grenfell, whether from fear of her reception or, 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 or a more general cowardice, I do not know. But if you if you feel ready to talk about that, the number you need is 03456060973. So I want to know how her periods in power, whether at the Home Office or as Prime Minister, I want to know how they affected you. I want to know what you are going to remember. Um, and I want you to tell me on 03456060973. So we've got Windrush, and, and I, I don't think on this programme we, we cover Windrush enough. I know we cover it more than anybody else, but that's not really the point, is it? If, if, if certain quarters, corners of the media aren't covering it at all, then we have a kind of responsibility here to cover it even more but we we need a little bit of help on fully understanding what she did to your family so as a Windrush family what did Theresa May do to you broader questions about the hostile environment the way in which once it was a relatively straightforward process to to come here to work to start paying taxes to slot effortlessly into society but they wanted to make it harder they wanted to make it a more hostile environment rhetorically speaking when she talked about the citizens of nowhere how did that impact on you but in in terms of policy specifics i'm thinking windrush in terms of political decisions i'm thinking grenfell in terms of uh well i slightly more i mean she put chris grayling in charge of probation didn't she or, or did she was that david cameron i know that her and chris grayling because this is in the secret barrister's last, last book were responsible for making it much harder for people to receive compensation if it turned out that they'd been wrongfully convicted. I, I just, I'm just looking at all sorts of things. I'm looking at all sorts of things to essentially assemble the proper legacy for, for a woman who in a country where the media is so right wing now, it's forgotten what way is up and what way is down. You think I'm exaggerating? I refer you back to the front page of today's Daily Express. Brexit is a great British success story worth billions. Uh, in a media that's as bent as that, Theresa May's legacy is unlikely to be properly assembled um, uh, except by voters. All right. So 
tell me how her periods in power, whether at the Home Office or in Downing Street, affected you. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. It's um, it's 11 minutes after 11. I'll remind you, actually, because coppers... I, I mean, we've got a story bubbling under today about people leaving the army in their droves, an exodus of officers, an exodus of, of, of soldiers from the army causing huge problems for the future. But, I, I mean, coppers as well. I, I, that, that idea that she, through cuts, not just through creating an atmosphere which you no longer wanted to be in, but through deliberate cuts to the police service... It, arguably, that is the greatest legacy of Theresa May because she wasn't going to be able to stop the tides of Brexit. She probably wasn't going to be able to stop Brexit being implemented in the worst imaginable ways because it was always going to be decided or or, or ruled over by people who didn't understand any of it. You know, the, the world in which Jacob Rees-Mogg could become Secretary of State for Business or a Minister for Brexit Benefits. These are people who understood nothing. I'm not sure she was ever going to be able to stop that. So if you remove the unicornism from her legacy and look instead at the impact, I wonder whether it is the police service, what she did to the police as Home Secretary under the cloak of austerity that will be her longest legacy, her, her, her ugliest legacy. I, I, I could be wrong. I'll remind you of some of those moments, actually. Um, th th this is possibly the, the most extraordinary thing about her period as Home Secretary was the argument that if you reduce the number of police officers, you will not reduce the quality of policing on the on the streets or, or in the country. This was in May 2015. First public speech since being reappointed as Home Secretary after that general election. Uh, the Police Federation was screaming from ev every street corner you could imagine that if you cut numbers, things will get worse. But Theresa May knew better. This weekend... The Federation warned that spending reductions mean that we'll be forced to adopt a paramilitary style of policing in Britain. Today, you said that neighbourhood police officers are an endangered species. I have to tell you that this kind of scaremongering does nobody any good. It doesn't serve you, it doesn't serve the officers you represent, and it doesn't serve the public. In 2002, you said David Blunkett had done more harm to the police in five minutes than others have taken years to do. In 2004, you said Labour were going to destroy policing in this country forever. And in 2007, you said the government had betrayed the police. Now, I disagree with Labour policies. But even I don't think those things are true. You said police officers were demoralised in 2002, 2004, 2007 and 2012. You warned of police officers' anger in 2002, 2005 and 2008. And you warned that the police and the public were being put in danger in 2001, 2004 and 2007. The truth is that crime fell in each of those years. It's fallen further since, and our country is safer than it has ever been. Extraordinary, really, to compare that with observable reality. Chris puts it very well. I'm an ordinary constable close to retirement. This means I worked through a Labour administration and was able to compare directly with the police service before and after she became Home Secretary. Chalk and cheese, James. She oversaw the ruination of the service from physical working conditions to pay, to pension and to public confidence. So let's look at the list. You can put anything you want on it. I, I've, I've suggested Windrush, if that affected your family. I've suggested policing, if, like Chris, that describes you. Uh, I, I think that the failure even to appear in the immediate aftermath of Grenfell is something that really should haunt her to, to her um, to her dying days. But there, there'll be stuff we've missed off the list as well. So the things that Theresa May, as a politician, did to you. And don't be shy. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. And uh, the, the, the 
decision by Theresa May to leave Parliament, I, I can understand why you might not think it's as important as some of us are uh, uh, essentially behaving, but she is a former Prime Minister. I know we've had so many in the last few years that it feels like so what, but it's really, really important. You look at the legacy, particularly a Prime Minister who did actually win an election, albeit uh, uh, only just, then you have a... A sort of historical responsibility, but I'm, I'm conscious of the Theresa habilitation that's underway and keen perhaps to address it slightly with rather more personal perspective. So it's how Theresa May, either as Home Secretary and or um, Prime Minister, directly affected your life, all right? James is in Chester. James, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Hi, hi James. Um, uh, I'm calling because... Basically, the hostile environment uh, and also Brexit, but the hostile environment. No, we really... can't. We can't blame her for Brexit. I think. I, well, no. I mean, uh, possibly. I mean, she presided over it a little bit, but yes. the hostile environment um, has really thrown a spanner in my life the last eighteen months or so. I'm Australian by birth, but I'm a British citizen. I got my citizenship when I was five or six, and I came to the UK um, with my my parents. My father's British. Yeah, and then, uh, and then I, I left when I was around uh, twenty-one, just after university. I went to live in Denmark um, for around six or seven years, uh, and then I, I had a life in Denmark. I had a partner. We had kids, uh, and then about two years ago, I started getting very kind of homesick. Sure, basically, and I I wanted to come back to the UK, and we've been unable to do that pretty much um we we're currently living between denmark and the uk in essence uh so my one of our children is british my my our youngest son he was born in the uk uh but our eldest is not british because i can't pass on my britishness because i was born in australia right he wasn't born in the uk now the reason we can't come back is i'm I need to have a British job and a British income. I'm a small business owner. I run an online business in Denmark. In order to to get a visa, either my partner needs to get a, a British job, and we've got a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and uh, yeah, they're they're a bit of a handful. And um, she hasn't been able to get a British job over the last few months. And, and wh- why do, why are we confident that this is Theresa May's fault? So in 2001, when my family came back to the UK jobless, yeah. my mother was not a British citizen. She was just able to come. Absolutely no question. So, these, no this is, this is, so the desperation to look as if they were being tough on immigration is going to catch people like you in this net. While the, yeah. I mean, for people who, who live and die by such statistics, while the overall figures have actually gone through the roof, um, Brexit was sold to those people as a way of reducing them. They have actually tinkered with the red tape as it were to the detriment of 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 british citizens like you basically yeah um I, i'm not saying that we deserve to come here any more than those people either I, I, that's really not what i'm but if you do if i mean that's what citizenship is though I, it's not a question of deserving it's a question of the, sure. the, the the rights that are bestowed by citizenship isn't it sure Sure. I mean, but I, this is because I, your your wife would have to be earning over a certain threshold, or your joint income would have to be over a certain threshold, and, and it would have, yeah, and it would have to be British. So I could move my business entirely to the UK, but then I'd have to wait eighteen months, and on top of that, in order to get the visa, my partner would have to leave the UK for six months plus with the kids while the visa is sorted out, while I stay in the UK and work separately from her. On top of all of that. And, and of course, the reason why this was a political decision is summed up in her phrase. I mean, you are a citizen of nowhere, aren't you? Well, why, according to her, yes. I find that deeply offensive. Well, I, I find it deeply offensive, and it wasn't, even, it, it wasn't even about me. But the idea that we... Why should we be worrying about people who move around a lot? Why would she... Why, why, would, I mean, that's what she was talking about. That's what she was saying, I think. I, 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 I think so. I mean, the, as... People are, uh, we've seen through the pandemic, people are able to work more online. They don't necessarily have to be tied into an office. The world is changing, but some people are desperate to keep us separate in our little boxes. And it. Well, it doesn't, I don't know what it was supposed to achieve because the sort of red meat merchants are not really thinking about people like you and they demand that there is 
lower immigration. I, I mean, it's become increasingly clear over the years. They're not really thinking about anybody real, they're, 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 except a few extreme examples and a sort of mythical hordes detailed in the pages of the Daily Mail. But they, they, the, the idea that anybody who wants less immigration wants people like you not to be able to move here is absurd. And yet I that's what... I can't even what, pay tax. That, I would love to be able to pay yeah. British tax, for example. Instead, I'm now looking for a British job I'm going to have to continue running my, my Danish business, wind it down a bit if I manage to be successful in getting a British job and take quite, uh, take quite a large pay decrease and pay substantially less tax to the British state than I otherwise would be happy to do. It's a very it strange way of doing business, isn't it? And you're right, I think, to, 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 lay, it at her, to lay it at her door. Um, and, and, I mean, it makes a mockery of claims to family values or being the, the the party of family or caring about all the things that growing up, even I believed that the Conservative Party did actually care about. I wish you well, James. I hope things improve. 24 after 11 is the time. Roger is in Wembley. Roger, what would you like to say? Uh, James, when Theresa May was in office as Home Secretary, my daughter was a serving police officer on active duty. And if you remember uh, at the time a few years ago when the two female officers were shot and killed in Manchester, yeah. trying to arrest a suspect. Well, a few weeks after the funeral, my daughter came home and she asked if we have a quiet word. And she took me into another room away from the family. Yeah. And she said, uh, I want you to make me a promise. I said, well, what is it? And it's just unusual. She's not even completely serious. She said, if I get killed in the line of duty, will you promise me to keep Theresa White? Theresa May, away from my funeral. I don't want that woman anywhere near me cool. when I die. And I, that was a written, just, it came in such a shock. And she's not, she used to tell me some of the things that happened at work that kept me, uh, didn't want my wife to know a lot of it. Yes, of more, course. I understand. The difficult, the difficult things. Yes. But yeah, she just, she, she just asked me to make that promise. And that was just in, indicative of how the police really did hate Theresa May. And especially after what happened with that, that funeral of those poor officers. She's used it as a media opportunity, I think. And it's just uh, I'm sure she, I mean, I'm not going to argue with you or your daughter, but I, I don't, I mean, it, it's a fairly, it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly sweeping accusation to say that she'd used it as a media opportunity because as Home no. Secretary, if she hadn't turned up, we probably would be remembering that now in the way that we remember her failure to turn up at Grenfell, Roger. But I'm not defending her, you know that. Oh, I'm, no, I'm, I'll apologise for saying that. Perhaps you don't I'll have to apologise. You don't have to apologise. You, you had to deal with that extraordinary request from your daughter, which, which opens up all manner of contemplations that no no parent would ever want to to endure and 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 that's perfectly reasonable but i but i do i i, I would just say if she hadn't turned up she'd have probably got into more trouble than 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 yeah i just never realized that officers I mean, i've had police officers in my family for decades of, in various you know branches of my family but to hear my own daughter say that, that she felt so strongly about theresa may and how she, you know, and what she was doing to the police force and lack of support but uh, it was a shock to me. Oh, well, I bet it was. <clears throat> and it will be a shock to people listening, although possibly less so to, to police families, less so to police officers familiar with the, the resentment that you describe, um, familiar with the bitterness that you describe towards someone who did that thing that is almost impossible to, to get your head around. Or even under the cloak of austerity, even at a time when the Conservatives were dedicated to the idea that the best way to improve public services would be to starve them of funds. And we're seeing the consequences of that now, of course, with councils going bankrupt up and down the country, potentially. But to say to a police officer that the quality of policing is not affected by the quantity of police, I, I, I mean, even saying those words now, years later, it's... it's extraordinary the quality of policing is not affected by the quantity of police we're going to cut police numbers and it won't affect police and the conservative party's come full circle like it has on so many things boasting now about increasing police numbers while hoping that you won't remember they were responsible for cutting them in the first place same party a lot of the same people some of them in the similar positions and yet there it is i mean a, a, a timely reminder if you like of the um the reality that police officers have to deal with paul's in bromley paul what would you like to say uh, uh, hello, hi. Uh, hello, just, just a, yeah, it's uh, just a quick one, really, just to tell you a little bit how I've, I've been affected when she was Home Secretary. I mean, I have no word to describe uh, this person. I can't use it in, in national radio. But I came here as a, as an immigrant. My wife was EU citizen from France. Yes. And I applied to have, obviously, the right to, the confirmation of my right to work. So, uh, 
I send the application to the post. I wait four months. I don't even have any any confirmation of a letter saying, look, you apply. I, made a, I have to make a complaint to her department, a, a serious complaint. And then through the investigation of that complaint, they send me a confirmation of application. This is her hostel. I have to wait nine to ten months before even having any document to travel. Because I was an EU citizen, I couldn't get out of the country. So he, he was like, he, he, you know, in a small jail. So I couldn't get out of the country. I was walking around with a letter. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, was, it was really, really difficult. I mean, but that, I, but I that is how. it. I don't think people fully appreciated what hostile environment meant. It, it, it literally meant make it harder for people to live normal lives in this country, dependent on their... their, their country of birth depending on their origins not even i mean we haven't even touched on deportations or which would be closer to the windrush thing people who uh, essentially denied nhs access because they were being accused of uh, of, of being illegal immigrants uh, because they simply had never got around to doing the paperwork 10 30 40 50 years ago paul that you were trying to do while she was actually in the Home Office. It is extraordinary. I like this from uh, Paul, who's in Leicester. He just writes, and it means our work here is done, probably. Blind me. And here was me thinking that Theresa May was a moderate. <laughs> I've got to sort my memory out. Don't worry, Paul. That's what we're here for. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 26 minutes to 12, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I don't know that I say this often enough, but you can have two ideas in your head at the same time. So it can be simultaneously true that Theresa May was probably the least bad of the last five prime ministers, and that she was bloody awful. I, I, I don't know whether that's unfair on David Cameron. I don't think it is, personally. Anything that Theresa May did as Home Secretary is essentially on David Cameron, because he made her Home Secretary. So she can be the least awful of... Cameron May, Johnson, Trust, Sunak, but she can still be absolutely awful. And some of the stories we've heard already um, rather prove that point, don't they? And we may hear a couple more, but I do also this hour want to get up to speed on what this uh, island, essentially, that Joe Biden announced he is going to be building on the coast of Gaza to help get aid into that benighted territory and an extraordinary story. I wonder if you can guess who it is. If I could tell, you know, I've just talked about the last five Conservative Prime Ministers. If I told you that it has emerged in the last few hours that one of them, uh, on, on a flight, while in office, not necessarily in, in the Prime Minister's office, but in office, one of the politicians whose names have popped up today, one of the last five politicians to become Prime Minister in the last five Tory administrations, managed to spend more than £15,000 on in-flight catering for a single trip to Australia. Which one would you think it was? See, this is what I mean about Theresa May, OK? I tell you, so there are five names. I give you David Cameron. I give you Theresa May. I give you Boris Johnson. I give you Liz Truss. I give you Rishi Sunak. And if I said to you that one of them had such an overweening sense of entitlement that they ran up a £15,000 in-flight catering bill on a single flight to Australia, I would be fairly confident that it was not Theresa May. That's the nicest thing I can say about her today. Who do you think it would have been? We'll find out uh, shortly after 12.45 today. Which one of those five? Cameron, May, Johnson, Trust, Sunak. Who on earth could be so entitled and so contemptuous of public money that they could run up... As much money as Michelle Donnellan spends, as much taxpayers' money as Michelle Donnellan spends on uh, clearing up our own libels on in-flight entertainment on a flight to Australia or in-flight catering on a flight to Australia. But back back to uh, Theresa May's true legacy. Terry's in Gravesend. What is it for you, Terry? Yeah, I was uh, um, in the Met um, during her reign as uh, Home Secretary. And um, when she took... I think it was about 400 million off the budget for the Met for, on one occasion. Clearly, the Met had to cut back somehow. They got rid of some quite a lot of uh, civilian staff mm. who were doing vital work, prepping papers for court and, and that sort of arranging wi- uh, witnesses. Um, who's left to do it? Well, you tell the, me. Uh, 
Oh, that's a rhetorical are... question, isn't it? Really? <laughs> I mean, I suppose on the plus side, Terry, it takes so long to get to court these days that they don't really need any paperwork if it's going to be five years hence. They're probably waiting for it all to be done by unicorns or digitally or something <laughs> like that. But it is a, it is a huge... What's the word? Just a diminishment of what used to be taken for granted in the context of the public sector. Indeed. Um, I, I say, you uh, and people say, oh, civilian staff and what have you, they did an a, a outstanding job, you know, and um, we relied on them quite heavily. And then they, they're taken away from you. And then we start, the same people that were cheering on the cuts are now complaining that you can't get police officers to attend incidents because in some yeah. cases they'll be too busy doing the paperwork that was previously done by the civilian staff it's almost like these yeah. things are linked isn't it yeah you might think so it's extraordinary <laughs> no thank you mate I, and, and I, I think the police actually looking at my inbox as well as my switchboard the police are probably the ones who have the biggest beef if you like with the idea of the Theresa habilitation that is understandably underway uh, across much of the british media today um seth's in tunbridge wells seth what would you like to say I'm really sorry I'm going to have to make you insert that uh, message about the Samaritans. But my friend's uncle, Clive, went to Jamaica for a funeral. Yes. And trying to come back, he was told by the airline that he didn't have, because the airline was doing the uh, vetting for the home office, that he didn't have the right, in their instructions, he didn't have the right to return to the UK. He'd been here since he was five years old. This went backward and forward for a while. The Jamaican government tried to help out. Nobody could get Theresa May's minions who have decided to turn the Home Office from a processing and administrative centre to one that only looks for ways to reject and make life miserable. Nobody could help. And Clive committed suicide in, in, in Kingston. I'm sorry, but that's Whoa. what happened. Okay, I understand now. I was a bit confused by your trigger warning at the beginning of this call, Seth, but you, 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 you were right to provide it, and I'm glad that you did, and I will remind people of the Samaritan's phone number at the end of this conversation. But you're, and, and, and the Samaritans are always absolutely clear that no single event is, is ever the, 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 the full and complete story of why somebody would choose to end their own life. But, but you are talking about somebody who who reached the end of their tether while being treated deliberately uh, in the way that you describe. I think, I think Clive had come here when he was five or six years old. And how old was he when he seven. died, Seth? How old was he when he passed? Um, he passed, Clive must have been about uh, late 60s, early 70s. He, he'd only gone for a funeral. It was only a funeral in Kingston. He went to a, in Spanish Town and, and in Kingston um, where, where nothing else was working and he was, he was staying on outside somebody's house at the back of someone's house. Yeah. He, couldn't, he, could, he, he had no money. Everybody here that had sent was sending and then sometimes you get money in Jamaica and because you get money from the UK or because they know you've been deported from the UK or blocked from returning to the UK, there are certain elements that feed off of you like parasites and, yeah. and, and the man was insecure. After spending his entire life here, yeah, um, and he didn't have he didn't have a support structure in in, in Jamaica. Nothing. It's not as if he you know it's not nothing. as if he had a, a a second family living there no. waiting to look after Mrs. him. His May, entire Mrs. life was here. His entire life was here. His entire life was here. Mrs. May's home, Mrs. May's home office, and and the hostile environment meant that they had taken away his medication. They had taken away his home. They had got had made his employer fire him while he was in in Jamaica. He could. While, while he was making his application back to the UK, his employer uh, withdrew his, his, his employment. He'd lost his, his, his uh, medication from the NHS. He wasn't getting any fun. And his, even his bank cards couldn't work in Jamaica anymore because they blocked his bank account. What is he going to do? This is, this is why Mrs. May created an environment and an, and an office where people went home on the weekend to their families, but her minions went home and tried to find ways to make people's lives more miserable. You go home to your daughters and your wife. These people go home to try to find ways to make life more miserable and to reject people for the simple reason of being born in a different place. I, I have no words to describe what you've just told, to respond to what you've just told me. It's not a story I've come across before, obviously, but it's it, 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 and, and elements of it may be extraordinary, but it's but but the but the subtext of it, the baseline of it is far from unique as you know. People who who had known no other home waking up uh, as a consequence of, a, of, of, of an employment check or an NHS encounter or leaving the country for what they thought was a holiday or a visit to a funeral, suddenly discovering that the Home Office had decided 
in its wisdom that they weren't actually British or that they had no right to be in the only country that they'd ever called home. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, actually, Seth, how... What's the word I'm looking for? I, a couple of texts coming in saying, when do we get our post office program? I know there have been dramatizations of the Windrush experience, but there hasn't been, has there? The, the sense of public outrage at the treatment of people like Clive and countless others that we, see, we, we have seen belatedly in other areas of, of British yeah. life, whether, it, whether it's Hillsborough or whether it's the post office yeah. sub postmasters or the tainted blood scandal what would i mean what family did clive have here did he have children did he have you said he was your friend's uncle i think yeah he he, he was my friend's he was my friend's uncle and he tried to help as much as possible but that's the other thing if you if you're deported to some countries you're okay you're fine but you get deported to jamaica well blocked he wasn't, even he, wasn't deported. He, he was well he was he was deported de facto except he paid for his own flight and they wouldn't let him yeah. back in again yeah 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 yeah, and that's part of the hotel environment that you have airlines and you have uh, you have landlords and you have banks and you have everybody else, everybody, NHS, everybody working against you for the simple reason being that you're different. And this this you know? idea that I mean, this was it, wasn't it? It was born of the Daily Mail and Rupert Murdoch. The idea that the country was full of people who'd sort of come here under false pretenses and were simultaneously stealing our jobs and also living on benefits and also sending all the money back home. These sort of triple whammies of mythologies. And because you can't actually fight a non-existent enemy, they turned people like Clive into an enemy and punished him. In the way that you describe, I hate that story, mate. That is one of the worst things I've ever heard in the twenty years that I've been presenting this program. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I really am. And the number four Samaritans, which I think we all understand now, which why Seth referenced it at the beginning of that contribution, is is one one six one two three, and they're available twenty four hours a day for anybody in emotional distress, struggling to cope, or indeed at risk of suicide throughout the United Kingdom and. The Republic of Ireland, and if, if you don't fancy speaking to a volunteer who are always on the end of the phone lines, there are, there are other methods, including email as well. If you just head to Samaritans.org, you can find out all of those all of those avenues as well. Ah, there you go. Talk about legacy now. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.48 is the time. Here's something I've never had to do before, and I haven't even told him that I'm about to do it, so I suspect his ears in the newsroom will be pricking up imminently and indeed immediately. I need to apologise for something that Thomas Watts did during his news bulletin. I've received at least three complaints. Now, what Thomas did, apparently, and I didn't notice myself, was he uh, unwittingly inserted a pregnant pause in the middle of one of the stories that appeared in the Half Past Eleven news. And, uh, and the pregnant pause followed the words that Britain is to join the EU. <laughs> and, and V and Adam and many others, actually, more than three, all, uh, all suffered a little at that moment. V says, oh, my God, your newsreader just said Britain is to join the EU and then paused before adding and the US, etc. I think he may have given me a heart attack. Uh, and Adam writes, when Tom was reading the news and said Britain to join the EU and then paused before completing the sentence, I thought I'd somehow missed a complete U-turn on Brexit overnight and that the last couple of years were just a bad dream. So, uh, I, I, I mean, I, we certainly don't need to apologise uh, on Thomas's behalf. But, um, but my goodness me, I, 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 I will. I, that's, not, that's, not, that's not fair, is it? Talk about leading a horse to water and not letting it have a drink. But, um, but there you go. So, so I've often said to you that the best bit of radio is the silence. The pauses, the silence can sometimes be louder than words, louder than bombs. Uh, and there's a very, very good example of it. I didn't, um, I, didn't, I didn't notice that myself at the time, but my goodness me, you did. It is 10 to 12. It's solve a problem uh, and possibly open up another one. This uh, first, I mean, we, you could cover this story in quite a light-handed fashion, light-hearted fashion, or light-handed fashion, but light-hearted. Uh, and then, of course, you... We'll probably start thinking halfway through treating it in a light-hearted fashion that it's anything but. I'd remind you that the phrase magic money tree has popped up a few times on today's programme as we resist the exhortations to rehabilitate the reputation of Theresa May. The magic money tree, remember, when a nurse who hadn't had a pay rise for eight years 
uh, raised her plight with Theresa May. She was told there's no there's no magic money tree that you can shake things from. Uh, this week, we've learned that Michelle Donnellan, who's still the Secretary of State for Science, spent £15,000 of your money settling a libel that she made completely voluntarily on Twitter. I learned last night that she received legal advice before posting the libelous tweet, but we won't be allowed to see what the legal advice was, unless presumably a Freedom of Information request kicks in and focuses her mind on the issue in the same way that Freedom of Information requests focused her mind on the issue earlier this week and prompted her to reveal that it was actually £15,000 worth of our money that was spent on settling that libel case, although I don't think that the um, legal fees were included in that. Peter Gagan, as you know, is a master of the Freedom of Information request, and I suspect it may have been one of those that has prompted um, another revelation from his... uh, Organization Peter, of course, an investigative journalist at the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. A democracy for Sale is his substack, um, and he, he joins us now. I did a little quiz earlier, and two things happened, Peter. I suggested that people should try to guess who had run up an enormous bill on in-flight catering during a journey to Australia out of the last five prime ministers, albeit that it hadn't happened during their premiership. And it also, the same little quiz prompted um, a a response from Simon Calder, the doyen of travel journalists, of course, that this isn't necessarily the worst offence committed by the offender that you're about to reveal to us. But I can tell you, my listeners, whether because they've already seen the story or because they have great powers of perspicacity, they all guessed correctly. So tell us what happened and tell us who it was. So so your listeners, James, will not be shocked to hear that we're talking about the former Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Short-lived, but former Prime Minister nonetheless. Yeah, the title stands. She's even got it on the front of her new book, mate. And well, as Politico revealed earlier this week, uh, she spent more than fifteen thousand pounds on in-flight catering during a single trip to Australia when she was running the Foreign Office. So when she was Foreign Minister, they went on a private jet uh, to uh, to Australia. It was twelve government representatives, and it cost a cool one thousand four hundred pounds per head. Uh, to to uh, you know, it's, it's a long journey, but I think a lot of people would still find that. Uh, quite a surprising bill to, to be landed with with a single trip to Australia. Well, how many people were in her entourage? There was there was twelve representatives. You so it was, it was it, there was a twelve. So it was, yeah, it was quite a, a very hefty bill for a single trip. And this was the trip she took. This is what Simon Calder has reminded me of because I think it was his his story for the Independent back in January of 2022. Is that there were there were chartered jets. There were there were normal flights. There were scheduled flights available, but she decided to charter her own jet for this journey. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, instead of the, I would say of course, but yeah, there, were, there was it was there were chartered flights exactly. That, that instead of the chartered flights, you could have taken on that. You could have sat in a plane like any of the rest of us and had uh, been fed on the plane. But instead, these were uh, these were special flights put on just for uh, Liz Truss and her entourage. Qantas go every day. Qantas departures every day, and uh, two hundred and thirty-five passengers on a normal plane. But the the one that they. Uh, chartered is kitted out with a VIP interior, including lie flat beds. So, I mean, you could do one or the other. You could either sleep for the entire journey and justify it, or you could eat for the entire journey and justify it. But to do both, to be running up a 15 grand catering bill and a half a million pound charter a private jet bill, uh, is, is frankly extraordinary. Why does it matter? Why do we still care, Peter? Why is it still news, albeit not everywhere? Well, one of the most interesting aspects of this story, James, is that this trip took pl- place in January 2022. Mm. And as you say, lots of journalists, like myself, use the FOI Act a lot. And uh, as an aside, Aunt Michelle Donlan, I'd actually already put in my request before she uh, before she came out with the bill. So, yeah, I can see what well, prompted exactly. her. There was probably yes. more than one of, one of us as well who came in with that request. But back in 2022, Emily Thornby, as she's just uh, she's just t- said earlier today, mm. uh, put in a request uh, to the Labour Party for, for some information about this and that this was batted backwards and forwards between the cabinet office which was held it they said we don't have the information when it was the foreign office initially and then the cabinet office we don't have the information uh we don't have in the, in the, in the form you needed etc etc so for two years and if anybody is a journalist like i using the foi act it's really hard to get out information on the government it's actually never been harder but eventually 36 hours ago this information was released but unusually in this case, normally if I put in an FOI request, the information is sent to me. Right. In this case, that doesn't seem to be what happened. Emily Thornby is saying that instead of the information being sent to her, it was sent to the news desk of, of, a, of a media organisation that subsequently published it and co- took comment from her, etc. But that's a very unusual way. And it's just worth remembering what was on, what was on Wednesday, James. It was the budget. It was. 
It was indeed the budget. So the timing you're suggesting was designed to uh, uh, be overshadowed. Well, this is actually what Emily Thornby suggested earlier today. Uh, she said that uh, she felt that this is exactly what was happened. Was this story was put out uh, intentionally on the Wednesday? This information, in two years, you know, two years she's had this request in, and it, it does seem slightly surprising that the very day you decide to release this information, slightly out of the blue, is the very day we have the budget. Have you ever have you ever flown by private jet? I haven't, James. I feel like I should. Right, no, should, I feel like maybe it, we should know, charter like one for out. research for research purposes. Have you ever turned left on an aeroplane? I haven't. I'm not sure I've done that either. No, I'm not sure. I think I did once because someone was listening to the show and they got us an upgrade on the way back from America. But I just, I, I don't want to sound like you know a, a church mouse. But I, how do you run up such an enormous? I mean. I, m- most of the flights I go on, you have to pay for the in-flight catering these days. The days of getting a nice, nice free meal are, 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 be- are behind us. But how do you run up a sort of over a thousand pounds per head on a catering bill on a single flight? I mean, what would I you think- order? Is it caviar? I mean, is it, is it, is it, or is it, is it that if you if you book a private jet, then everything's really, really expensive anyway? It's like going to that place with the bloke who sprinkles the salt from ten feet in the sky. That bay. Person. What was his name? Salt Bay. So I'm, I'm speaking gibberish to you, aren't I? But you've got no idea who Salt Bay is, have you, Peter? I do. I've seen. Do I've seen the beef thing. I All think right. I've seen this on the internet. You pay like a bazillion pounds for a for a lamb chop or something like that in in certain restaurants. What? What? I mean, do we know how you can run up a bill that big just on catering on a plate? Well, I would, I would suggest I could put in a freedom of information request, but given that this one has taken two years, two years. I'm not sure that's going to be that helpful. Two full years to ask. You know, this is taxpayers' money as well. It, it, it's a quite a simple question as well. How much did this cost? Yes, and there it is. £15,639. 3.4% of the total cost of the tickets. So, I, I mean, maybe people listening spend time on private jets and they can tell us what it was that you need to order. Probably just loads of booze, do you think? Absol- they're probably absolutely Absolutely mullered. I couldn't possibly no, comment on that. But I'm leaving you again, into it, amateurs. You know, it is, it, it is a, it is a, you know, there's apparently, actually, and interestingly, Emily Thornby said that she initially asked how much was spent on alcohol, and the government came back and said, after many months of fighting her freedom information request, we can't, we don't have the breakdown, we can, but we all we know is how much was spent in total. So that was what uh, eventually, two years later, the government re- revealed. And while I have you. Would you get a freedom of it? I mean, I don't know whether legal advice falls under this remit, does it? Because I, I discovered last night, as I'm sure you did as well, that Michelle Donnellan did actually get legal advice before publishing that libelous tweet about the academics that she accused of supporting Hamas and then has spent £15,000 appropriately enough, coincidentally, given that's the figure under discussion here, on settling the case um, of taxpayers' money. And the, the the current reluctance stroke refusal to make that legal advice public, would that fall? Would you get that as a consequence of a free, even if it took 264 years to do? It should be. That is that is public information. There's such a clear public interest in that. It's, it's public money. So you money. think that, have it's, you put it in yet then? I have indeed, Jim. Oh, I did it yesterday. Go. Look at this. It's amazing. Things, like night follows day. This is extraordinary. <laughs> like a coiled, like a well-oiled machine, Peter. I, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for the refusal as we speak, James. When but you, if anybody yes. wants, I will be publishing even the refusal on my Substack because well, that's what I, I do too. Because the only thing to do is to shame them. I, well, exactly that. And, and uh, you're very good at not plugging your Substack, so I will do it for you. It is democracyforsale.substack.com. Um, I'm thinking of starting a Substack actually. So thank you, Peter. Peter Gagan, one of the great forces for good. I'm delighted that he's an increasingly regular presence on this program. But I might do. I don't really want to do a politics Substack. Mrs. O'Brien says I should do a politics substack i don't want to do it there's so many politics do you know what i want to do i want to do a culture substack because you love my recommendations for books and films and plays and stuff i'd like to do that on substack but i don't know if it i don't know if there'd be an appetite for it um it's coming up to 12 noon you are listening to james o'brien on lbc i think we'll change course completely next and look at either the school that is checking families bins Sending people around to see if their car's in the drive to try and bust people for going on unsanctioned holidays. Or the state of the railways. James O'Brien on LBC. And you've spoken in your... I mean, seriously, it's not even close to 52.48. You are a lot more interested in railways and trains than you are in the story of the school that is checking bins and snooping in all sorts of ways to make sure that pupils who have signed off as absent are actually absent for r- r- real reasons as opposed to having gone on a, 
an unsanctioned holiday, an unauthorised story. And th- actually, it was a piece in the I newspaper that turned my attention this morning to the state of the railways, coupled with my own life. Because I'm catching a train later today, and I won't tell you where I'm going, because obviously I would be overwhelmed by autograph hunters at the station, and th- that, would be, <laughs> that would be embarrassing for everybody concerned. But I noted... I just read the headline, on the wrong track, 1,000 trains a day cancelled as railways crumble. And, I I mean, the the, the quick breakout is that the most unreliable train firms are getting worse. Uh, Avanti's average daily cancellations has gone up from 13 between April and November of last year to 31 between November of last year and February this year. Transpennine has gone up from 19 to 20, Northern from 140 to 170, and Cross Country from 22 to 34. And I, I, it occurred to me for the first time that I no longer travel hopefully. Why is travelling hopefully a phrase? Do you know? Because it, thi- it is a thing. It's a thing. When I used to do public speaking competitions, one of the titles one year was travelling hopefully. It's, it's not the one that I did. I don't know what it means. I'm just asking you. What, what, what is, why is it a thing? It's a figure of speech, travelling hopefully. And I realised that I no longer travel hopefully. I've always travelled hopefully. I, I travel by train a lot. I only learned to drive when my wife got pregnant because she, I felt quite unreasonably, insisted that she wouldn't be able to drive herself to the, uh, the labour ward um, when, when her waters broke. So I had to get a driving licence at the age of about 32, possibly 34, I should check. So I've never been a big driver, never had the petrol head gene. You may have noticed that this is unique among radio phone-in programmes for finding motoring topics almost mind-numbingly dull, even when the big motoring topic of the day is a direct consequence of this radio programme. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that, that a low-traffic neighbourhood in somewhere, Streatham, has been suspended or something. Um, it's all because of me. It's all because of me. It's all because of the it's because of the pressure that we put on Sadiq Khan on Thursday when he was here for Speak to Sadiq. And as a direct consequence of that, they've now closed something somewhere about traffic, something, petrol, motors, cars, something, something. And some people are absolutely cock a hoop about this. Biggest story in town. And listen, I'm I'm being a bit tongue in cheek, obviously if you're caught up in a, um, an aberration of a low-traffic neighbourhood because the buses are travelling at uh, slower than a snail's pace, then it's problematic on every imaginable level. But it's not interesting to listen to on the radio. And how long did it take you to get to Budgeons and Back, Keith? Oh, oh, four days. Four d- 400 years, man and boy, it took me to get to Budgeons and Back. So anyway, I'll take all the credit for freeing up the streets of Streatham as a consequence of, actually it wasn't even me, it was a caller to the programme. Always get calls about low traffic neighbourhoods. Never interesting, which is why we only ever do it when Sadiq Khan is in the studio to take your calls. So the point that I'm making is that I, I travel by public transport a lot more than you would expect for a major f-list celebrity like me I, I am often to be found on buses i am often to be found on the london underground and if i have a long journey to make i am often to be found on proper trains proper overground you know intercity trains as we used to call them and i realized today when i saw that headline and thought about what i'm doing later i realized today that my relationship with the railways has changed it's changed quite profoundly so So I responded to this story in a very personal fashion. And I found myself thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get where I want to go at anything like the time that I want to be there anymore. I had to go to Hay on Wye a few months ago for uh, for an appearance. I've been traveling by train a lot because of my book tour. And it's been about 50-50. I'd say I've, I've never not ended up at the place where I wanted to be, but I've got there considerably later. And here's another thing I don't do anymore. And I grant you, this is quite a rarefied perspective on the issue. But I, if I can possibly avoid it, I go up the night before the gig or the day before the gig. I don't travel after the show to an event on the evening. I've done the radio show. I don't know whether you've noticed because I don't always mention it. I've done the radio show from some of our other studios around the country quite a lot in the last six months. I, I've done it from Glasgow. I've done it from Birmingham. Um, I've done it from Bristol. 
was great to catch up with with Cormac McMahon, who was the newsreader when I started here at LBC, and he's now the head honcho down in the Bristol newsroom. But I've, I've done it from a variety of Global's studio facilities up and down the country because I didn't want to run the risk of coming off air in London hopping on a train to do the gig and then hopping back on a train to get back. I didn't feel that that could actually be guaranteed anymore. And I was right because on a couple of occasions, even when I've gone to that trouble, even when I've been careful, I've got to my destination so late on the night before the event that I would never have been able to have done the event if, um, if I'd relied upon the trains getting there on time. So, well, I mean, what's the question? I'm not expecting anybody to ring in and uh, uh, talk about the plight of, of, of a best-selling author not being able to get to his book events on time because of the state of the trains. I'm looking at your relationship with the railways. And, and by that, I mean either as a passenger or as a professional. I love the railways. I hate these topics because you almost inevitably find yourself blaming the forward-facing individuals people who drive the despite the best effort of rupert murdoch and his foot soldiers over the last few years i have got absolutely no problem with train drivers earning a decent scratch and i think that other railway workers should have their wages increased as well because when i see the amounts of money making their way into the pockets of railway company shareholders and directors i realize that industrial action to pr improve your own pay packet is in large part a consequence of Railway companies doing what water companies have done, which is to suck out as much money as they humanly can from a former nationally owned resource in order to enrich investors and shareholders to the detriment not only of the service enjoyed by customers, but also of the men and women who work on that service. And they're the ones that get it in the neck every time things go wrong, every time things go badly. So what has happened? What has happened on the on the rails? How, how bad is it? Do you recognise as a commuter or as a passenger or a punter, do you recognise what I describe? And your experience will be more profound than mine because me relying upon trains to get me somewhere is essentially luxurious. You know, I've had the great privilege of taking a best-selling book on tour. It's not exactly the daily grind, is it? But you have changed your commute. You've changed. You've moved. How you just You cannot rely on the railway anymore in the way that you could, I think, even five years ago. But I want to hear your experience. And then, I mean, as a worker, how much has it changed as well? Uh, I mean, well, presumably for you now, it's a, it's a much more fraught experience than it was previously. You're dealing with very angry people, particularly people who are spending their entire journey with their face. And we're not talking about the underground. You get on the London Underground during rush hour, you run the risk of spending 40 minutes with your face in somebody else's armpit. That's been an occupational hazard since I moved to London in 1991. There's nothing new about that on the London Underground. I always remember those photographs of the Metro in Tokyo where they employ staff with cushions on sticks to push people to cram people on to that. Do they still do that? They cram people on. I thought those pictures were extraordinary when I first saw them. They've got like a big sofa cushion on the end of a pole and you use them to push people on, to cram them in just before the doors shut. So you're packed in to a railway carriage like sardines. And that's always been par for the course during rush hour on the London Underground. But now you could be packed into a carriage like that going all the way from London to Glasgow or from Bristol to Birmingham. It's extraordinary. The scenes that you see sometimes. So, what has it done to you? I, I suspect that the state of the railways has driven people back onto the roads at a time when we're supposed to be trying to cut down upon our carbon emissions. And if you work on the railways... Now, I don't want you to laugh at me. But I think, more than any other job, up to and including police officers, people who work on the railways, particularly train drivers and train guards... I and I could be wrong and you may well laugh at me and I may end up regretting what I'm about to say for the rest of the program but I think more than almost any other job except silly ones like being a footballer or an actor I think working on the railways is, is actually a childhood dream come true for a lot of people I, I, I genuinely think it's the same impulse that prompts people to start model railways and that's, I mean, I don't know if you've seen Rod Stewart's model railway, but nothing brings out the inner schoolboy more than a model railway for some people. Something about railways appeals to something almost primeval within us. 
and prompts a, a passion for the for the network for the service. I remember there's a steam railway near where I grew up, and my old maths teacher. I went to go take the kids around the museum. My old maths teacher was there working as a volunteer. Just loves railways. People love railways. I don't know whether it's the same as why I love bridges. I love bridges because they somehow speak of man's dominion over nature. Bridges and cranes are my thing. They show that, yeah, cranes, we, because you've tamed nature. A crane is how you tame nature. It's how you turn nature to your own benefit. A crane is a way of defying physics. You look at a viaduct. You look at the viaduct in Stockport. And, you know, that's Victorian. I mean, imagine what it would be if, it, if, if the Romans had built it. You look at a viaduct. It's a bloody canal in the sky is what it is. It's absolutely extraordinary that human beings have managed to do that. To completely... Sorry, that's an aqueduct. You're quite right. A viaduct is obviously a road in the sky or a railway in the sky. But the, the nature of railways appeals to something within us that I think is close to primeval. And that's why I think people who work on railways, the, high, the incidence of people working on railways as the fulfilment of a childhood dream, I put it to you, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you at this time that the incidence of people working on the railways who have fulfilled a, a childhood dream is higher than in any other job in this country. That's what I genuinely believe. More people working on the railways wanted to work on the railways when they were little than any other job, except possibly the army. Although we've got a story today about soldiers quitting the army in their droves. So I want to know what it's like to work on the railways and to not only observe this tragic decline, but to be an unwilling and unwitting part of it too. So there are two constituencies of caller that I am currently wooing. The first is the passenger. How has your relationship with the... I mean, I can't swear on the radio. If I could, I would say something like, how bleep are our... Just how bleeped are our railways? Just how completely and utterly bleeped are our railways? 03456060973. The second question is, what have you done? How have you changed it? Well, have you changed your life because you can't rely on the trains anymore? I, I, it might not sound like an interesting question, but get stuffed. It's my show, and I'm really interested in the answer. 03456060973. And then the third question is, you're working it. You're on there. Whether it's a fulfillment of your childhood dream or not, and I will ask, how does it feel? What's it actually like? I mean, you can also tell me how bad things really are and possibly even the beginnings of the why, but you know how my mind works. I'm, I'm just interested in you. I want to know what it's like to be driving a train, which you've always dreamt of doing and you've always loved doing it, but you're doing it now on a network and a service that is, a, f I mean, a, a pale shadow of what it used to be and what it should be. I quite like this. This is what I mean, you see, about trains, railways, not being a normal job. As someone who has worked for 24 years, says Carl, as a guard, train driver, instructor, depot manager, and now senior manager, I can tell you that a massive percentage of the issues faced by the railways is down to the industry being hoofed hither and thither across the skyline by politicians who are de deliberately myopic when it comes to the systemic problems of the industry. Let's dig into those problems from the point of view of both passenger and professional after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. I love this. I, see, I wasn't making it up. Um, I've been a railway signaller for nearly 20 years, James. And honestly, I've, every day I come to work, I say I'm living the dream. I've been a railway enthusiast for my entire life. I'm over 40 now. And every day at work, I get to play trains. I've even made a small model railway in the signal box. And I get to listen to you too. Hashtag living the dream. Please keep my name confidential. Your secret is safe with me. But that's what I mean. I wonder if there's some way of checking. Someone should do some research on this. What, what job has the highest percentage of people who are living their childhood dream work-wise? I, 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 anyway, I digress slightly. We're talking about the state of the trains. Catherine's in Headingley. Catherine, what would you like to say? Hi, uh, um, sorry if I'm a bit nervous. I'm a bit like... Uh, it's only me. Believe it's only um, me, Catherine. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, my um, I graduated last year and then I started getting a job from Headingley. So by car, I only live about 30, 40 minutes away. Right. 
But every morning it's and every night coming home, it's kind of a struggle to see if I will get home on time. So it's on average, it's taking me about an hour and a half to get home. Um, and that's on a good day. <laughs> um, there has been instances where, like, it's been maybe I've not gone to the house until maybe quarter to eight, and I finish about half four work wise. So you can't. So you don't drive. You rely on the train, but. Yeah, at some point, it, at some point, you might switch. I've been. I'm currently getting driving lessons. There it is. You see, um, because I'm not. I'm not great. <laughs> um, um, I only graduated driving. onto big roads last week. Yeah, I'm terrible. No, well, don't no, don't don't. Just confidence is a lot of it, but there's nothing worse than an overconfident driver. So just, it, it, it gets yeah. it gets better. I mean, I don't know why you're listening to me. I'm absolutely rubbish, but you, you it <laughs> does get. But the point is, you don't particularly want to drive to work and back. No. A train is a much more pleasant way of doing it, but you can no longer rely on the um on the service. You can't take it for granted that you'll be there with a bit of wiggle room either way at the time that you're supposed to be there or that you'll be home at the time that you need to be home. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's thrown everything kind of out of the window. So it's like, if I have friends that come up, I can uh, go for drinks in an evening because I'm tired, because I've only just got in. Um, I'm late for work more than I'm on time. Um, There has been like weeks where I've just never, I've got into work at like 10 o'clock and I start at nine. Um, there's nothing you can do about it see when i when i was your age i was working in a a clothes shop in worcester and if i was late because of the train the manager was such a little tyrant i had to get a letter off the station master but i mentioned that only or a note off the station master to confirm that the train had been late i mentioned that only because it happened so rarely he thought he could bust me for bsing by making sure (laughs) when i said oh i'm sorry i'm late the train was late it was such a rare occurrence that he thought i was lying and he made me prove that Whereas for you, it would be even more newsworthy if you turned up on time one day. Yeah, it's quite an extraordinary experience. I love <laughs> like, that. Where are you working? Well, because you live in Headingley, do you? Or you work in Headingley? Which is I what's the journey you do? What's the journey? So I'm from Pontefract. Oh. That's just like a little bit like Wakefield. I know and Pontefract. So it's about, oh, that's cool. No, it's rare. Well, I went to school with a lad from Pontefract. Yeah. Do you, do you know what his really nickname? I, th- I think his dad was a his granddad was a lord actually, but his um. Do you know what his nickname was? No. Ponty. Really? <laughs> yeah. Good old Ponty Carlo. <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> we called him Ponty. I wonder what happened to him. Um. So I know I know that journey well. I, well, I know that part of the world quite well. I went to school in Yorkshire myself, and you can't. I mean, it is. It, it's a perfect example. It's a. It's a. It's a hop, a skip, and a jump. Headingly to, to Ponty, and you, you can't do it by train. You're going to stop doing it by train. And, and the idea that we're trying to cut down on carbon emissions, that's someone in their first job, presuming that the train would be the best way to get there and back, discovering the reality is that it no longer is. 25 minutes after 12, Leo's in Carl Shulton. Leo, what's going on? James, thank you so much for bringing this up. We're bringing what? Uh, this particular topic. State of the trains. Uh, a big, big fan. Thank I mean, you. I'll never forget the day I saw the Flying Scotsman coming to Victoria. I, I, was once, I was walking up the canal in Brentford a few months ago and a bloody great steam train just went over the normal railway bridge there. That was, they I do. mean, utterly, un- I didn't even know. And and they go, it goes through Chiswick as well sometimes, the Flying Scotsman. It's a beautiful thing to see, but we digress. Well, exactly. However, I am a victim, a very, oh, very, very upset victim of the Elizabeth Line. I moved out to West Drayton, and remember, that's one of the main trains that goes from Paddington and out to Heathrow. It is an unmitigated disaster. Well, well yeah, but that's because a lot of the trains on the Elizabeth Line don't stop at West Drayton. No, they do. No, it's absolutely fine. The Maidenhead train does, the Reading train. It's not about that. It's about the unreliability mm. and the trauma that you have to go through on a daily basis. That line is known as the worst line in the country. I stayed at that hotel. Do you know the hotel just over the way from the West Drayton station? It's a not Fuller's. the De Berg Arms. No, it's the Fuller's, <laughs> the Fuller's pub. There's a Fuller's pub just, just yeah. over the way. I stayed there and uh, when we had builders in and... Uh, I, 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 I know a little bit of what you're talking about. You can't guarantee your journey, can you, in the way that you need to if you work normal hours somewhere? Well, I could. I lost my job. I mean, basically. And, and Oh, yeah. I mean, you could, literally every single, well, I'd say three or four times a week. I mean, I'm on the verge of setting up an action group. Because yeah, but so hang on a minute. The Elizabeth Line, is, it's only been open for 10 minutes. What, how are you getting to work? Four and back? years. Is it? Since nine, 2019 it opened. Did and it I'm really? telling you, James. If you look at it, I take a catalogue. I've become an, uh, an, an Elizabeth Line anorak mm. because I literally have to deal with it 
I can't get anywhere anymore, and it's constantly there's a problem. It's overhead wires. But I, I know, find but out I, what's no, wrong with it by I, listening to LBC before I, the people on the platform I, tell me that work for the company. The I TFL. feel your pain. Yeah, well, that's a great advert for LBC, and, and obviously I feel True. your pain. But what did you do before it opened? It's not. That's what I mean about it being relatively new. It's not. It's not. I don't know. It's quite. You're not. You're in a well, different. I didn't live there. <clears throat> I lived in Westbourne Park. Oh, I had I to see. deal with the Hammersmith and... Uh, City Line. Uh, City Line. Yeah. That was another wind-up. Well, no, it's better than the Elizabeth Line. A lot better. And you'll see, I think you'll probably find many, many people will tell you how awful it... But what they do is they just... They cancel, cancel, cancel. They tell you five different reasons why the train's not working. And then when you try and get information, and it's not the staff's fault, they don't get informed. And no. it's really frustrating because they keep saying, oh, the train will be here in 10 minutes, and then they cancel it again. And then you're two hours, three hours, four hours down the line. You're stuck. It's not a great, it's like it's not a great advertisement. Up. No, well, I, I feel your pain, actually. If I didn't before, I do now. Um, uh, why are you in Carl Shulton? Um, shall I tell you the truth? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Okay, it's not, so, you're not in the middle of a crime or anything like that, are you? No, 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 no. no, no not, nothing that exciting. Hang on. Uh, Evie wants no, to join your action group, mate. You've already got a, so you've got, you've got a flipping I, I recruit. I would. They're more than welcome. Um, you know. Well, really hang on. How did you get to Carl open. Shulton, then? So, my father had a heart attack. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Um, and my grandmother died what? the next day. She's 102. She just got all her medals awarded to her in August last year. Oh, there's the a lot going on War. in your world at the moment, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. And then I got bitten by an XL bully last Saturday. Right. None of which explains so why really you're... Time, James. None of which explains why you're in Carl Shulton exactly. Because my dad lives there, and I had to take him out of the hospital and discharge him, so I'm looking after him. Oh, well done. And, and did you rely on the railways to get there? Uh, I managed to get there, although, much to my shock, you're not allowed to take a bicycle uh, on our Victoria on the network rail, so Southern Railway. You're not allowed to take a, bi a bicycle uh, between 7 and 9.30, which is rush hour, and between 4 and 7 in the evening. So basically, any kind of idea about getting rid of pollution... Etc. But don't 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 think about well, cycling. Well, I, again, I, again, I feel your pain. But e equally, if you're on a busy train and someone tries to get on with a bicycle, then uh, you know I, it, it's the closest I ever come to coming out in support for public flogging. So it is. It, it swings. Yes. It swings and roundabouts. Um, is your dad okay? More importantly, but James, think about it. No, you the think about it. I just asked whether your dad was okay. Is he okay? He's fine. You okay. know what? He's absolutely much better. Well, don't than let him listen to this. Bad experience. Don't let him listen but to this show if his heart's a bit dodgy at the moment. It's the last thing he needs. Is that level of excitement? Especially with me jumping up and down. And well, and also and completely misrepresenting when the Elizabeth line opened. I knew that was right. Opened on the twenty fourth of May, twenty twenty two. Well, they've got that wrong then, because that's what, what you mean they've got that wrong then? That's the date that the Elizabeth line opened. It was opened by the Queen Elizabeth. So I don't know what your pressure group's going to do, but you need to get your docks in a slightly more convincing row before it before it launches. Whew. Amelia Cox is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Twelve thirty-four is the time. More railway. Related mayhem coming up shortly, but before that, rather rather more important matters. That that um, news report there that we've been hearing all morning. I don't know whether you noticed Amelia eliding perfectly between the EU and the US in her bulletin just then. The the, the UK will join the EU and the US, so absolutely no danger of. More complaints that people just had a little moment of thinking the newsreader on LBC was announcing that the UK is set to join the EU. Full stop. Which is what Thomas was accused of earlier by some of you. So, um, but the story, of course, that they are both reporting on is the news that well, it's, it's, it's two stories in a way. President Biden has ordered the U.S. military to begin uh, an emergency mission to build a port on the coast of Gaza to accelerate the supply of humanitarian aid, and then the corridor that would serve that port is something upon which the UK and the EU and the, and the USA and some others will cooperate. Um, Noga Tarnopolsky is a freelance journalist in Jerusalem who's helped us out and indeed helped LBC out many times um, on issues in that region, and she will no doubt do so again today. Um, this, is, this is a very big deal, Noga, but it is also quite confusing. I suppose we should start with the question of why it has to be built at all. Right, James. It is confusing, um, and it's also very weird, I have to say. Mm. One of the reasons it's hard to understand is that we all have a bit of cognitive dissonance. The United States and Israel are close allies, so it is bizarre 
that they would have had to resort to the air and the sea in order to transfer aid to Gaza, mm. urgently needed humanitarian aid. But the fact is that while Israel remains an ally of the United States, it appears very clear that uh, President Biden has begun to understand what many Israelis are now understanding, and it's that Prime Minister Netanyahu himself isn't that much of an ally. And so instead of engaging in any antagonistic behavior, what the U.S. and following the U.S. now Europe and the U.K. are doing is sort of ignoring him. Um, and so we find ourselves in this bizarre situation. Last week, after that terrible incident in which dozens, at least, of Palestinians were killed in a stampede um, and shot at aiming at, you know, aid trucks, mm. the United States unilaterally announced that it would start engaging in airdrops of food, which they did in collaboration with the Jordanian Air Force, as if we're talking about Mogadishu and not an area under the control of a close allied nation. And Israel just had to take it. And what we're seeing now is similar, but much more forceful. The United States is going to spend several weeks building an offshore seaport. This is a very significant investment through which it expects to bring masses of aid. Gazans are desperate for aid. The, there are more than 2 million people there, and the need is huge. And simultaneously, but separately, the EU is starting a different sort of aid transfer using Cyprus as a port. The waters off of Gaza are not deep enough to bring major ships. Okay. I, I suppose the first point to observe before we examine some of the uh, equally confusing elements of this story is that it, it suggests nobody is expecting any sort of ceasefire anytime soon. That may be, but I have to say, it, it appears right now that that's the case. That's true. But even if a ceasefire were to, be, were to begin tomorrow, the need of the Gazans is huge. Mm. And I think that these... You know, the U.S. and now Europe are looking for ways to get massive amounts of aid into Gaza. On the one hand, taking responsibility themselves so that it's safe and the Israelis aren't concerned that maybe arms or, you know, cement are getting in. Yes. So that's one thing. And on the other hand, that they, um, that they don't have to deal with the paralysis of the Israeli government because they're doing it on their own. Why has the, the flow of aid been so slow? Why has it proved so difficult to get the necessary aid into Gaza? Because Prime Minister Netanyahu is a deeply unpopular Prime Minister operating a dysfunctional government with extremist ministers who oppose the very idea of bringing any aid into Gaza. These are people who, after... October 7th, their basic response was shut Gaza off to the world. No water, no electricity, no nothing. And this is collective punishment, which is a war crime. Mm. And this also is not something that conforms to the Israeli official war aim, which is to destroy Hamas. This destroys the civilian population. But you have a prime minister who's incapable of standing up to these extremist ministers and who may be fairly extremist himself. So he tells the United States, of course, we're allowing aid in and they set up some sort of a system. But at the same time, with not even a wink, he allows Israeli protesters, right, ultra right wingers to go down to the border crossings and stop the aid trucks. So he's playing a double game. And to me, it looks very clearly like the United States has had it. Yes, that's the sort of, I mean, never mind the humanitarian <laughs> impact. The diplomatic reading is that the United States have decided they now operate autonomously in the context of ensuring the passage of aid into Gaza. Do you know what you just said about the government and about the, 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 um, uh, the vi if, you, if you like, the competing interests in, in that cabinet, perhaps makes sense of one element of the story that even by the 
confusing standards you've already referred to. I couldn't quite believe what I was reading. This is in the Daily Telegraph in London today. It says an Israeli official yesterday said the country welcomes the plan to deliver humanitarian aid by sea and will coordinate development of the project with the United States. And just wait for this bit, Noga. Israel, quotes fully supports, end quotes, creation of such a, f- <laughs> such a facility. The official said on condition of anonymity. <coughs> right. So what's going on there? It's, it's, I, I'm trying to think of how, what other words I could use to describe it, but what you read is exactly the point. Is the Israeli government currently is not a functional government. So it is, it has to resort to accepting these unilateral American statements about what's going on in territory that it ostensibly <laughs> controls. And it has to accept whatever the United States has decided to do in terms of humanitarian aid, as if the government didn't exist. And then the officials, including the highest officials of this government, are operating on the basis of leaks because they're scared and they have no idea what the actual policy is. And the prime minister is himself volatile. And um, they don't want to get mucked up in this general administrative chaos that has overtaken Israel. Um, not, none of which is particularly good news for the families of the hostages that are still being held in Gaza, of course. It's catastrophic news for them, and you right to mention it. And I have to tell you that the kind of anarchy reigning in Israel right now has really hit these families very, very hard. Oh. Last night, we saw something, I saw something I've, I never in my life could have imagined I'd see, which is an Israel police officer punching the mother of a hostage held by Hamas, a woman who looks to be in her late 40s, early 50s, punching her so hard that she fell to the ground and he had to clutch his fist in agony. And um, Grief. Yes, it's out of control, but we have to remember that the police is under the very hard... Um, hand right now of a minister who until he became a minister was considered a terrorist he's a con- someone convicted of crimes of terror in the state of israel he's one of these fringy loony allies of the prime minister who needed him because mm. he's on trial and we're all in israel there's a real feeling of descending into you know some sort of administrative political police abyss right now that's terrifying uh, it, i mean for all sorts of reasons uh, only some of which we've we've alluded to but we're short of time so i'll close with a with a question about the significance of benny gantz's meeting with Kamala harris on on monday um mm-hmm. and and his his e- expression subsequently he was surprised how angry the u.s was over the impasse in gaza i mean it speaks to what biden announced in his state of the union address but it also speaks to domestic Israeli politics, that, that Gantz is on this sort of diplomatic tour of world leaders, including this country, um, even though he is um, a, a opposed to Benjamin Netanyahu at home. That's right. And it's important to mention that in the UK, he actually had a half hour meeting with the prime minister, with yes. Rishi Sunak. Which, which infuriated um, Netanyahu, I read. Yes, I think most allied leaders right now are excoriating Netanyahu and the only thing I would want to mention in addition to that is that Netanyahu has maybe 20% approval among Israelis. Good Lord. So these foreign leaders are ma- taking a bet yeah. that Israelis understand and share their views. Um, in terms of the trip itself, you're absolutely right. It's an abnormal situation. Benny Gantz, who's a war cabinet member, should have known ahead of this trip how angry foreign governments are. The fact that he didn't have access to that information ahead of time is remarkable. And then the fact that he decided, for whatever reason, to unilaterally go on this trip Mm. also shows you that the Israeli government right now is hard. it's, It's hard for me to find the words to describe what? How little it's functioning as a real government well, of a sovereign used the word, state. You, you've used the word anarchy in a broader context. I suspect it, it's probably pretty close to the bone on the on the specifics of, 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 of government as well now. Yeah. Um, Noga, thank you. Noga Tarnopolsky. In some ways, I hope you'll allow me to say this. In some ways, your tone 
speaks almost as loudly as your words today. <laughs> that, the sense of frustration and confusion that I pick up from you as a, as a, as a, a, a close watcher of these events is remarkable. Well, I'm being dead honest with you because I think it's important to transmit this yes. reality, however grim and however confusing it really is. And we are very, very grateful for that. We really are. Thank you. Because, of course, much of what you tell us, much of what Noga reports from the, from the ground in Jerusalem is, is, is still slightly at odds with certainly what um, uh, some corners of the British media are reflecting, not least the provenance of that policing minister, which we've talked about a little bit on this programme, but which in the context of uh, 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 some of the coverage and some of the noises coming out of conservative politicians is, is truly remarkable. Noga Tarnopolsky, they're doing us, I think, doing us all very proud. 12.46 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10 minutes to one and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, if you follow me on Twitter, I, Noga has posted the picture, the footage of the incident she just referred to where an Israeli police officer punched the mother of one of the hostages still being held in Gaza so hard that he subsequently holds his own fist in agony. It's, I mean, it is a truly breathtaking piece of film that I, I will share with you shortly. But it, it also remains remarkable, to me at least, as someone who has tried and I think succeeded in keeping a very, um, a, a very even keel in coverage of these issues. Uh, remember, I, I, I don't, I'm not a great fan of the argument that the BBC can't be biased because the number of people accusing it of being right-wing is roughly the same as the number of people accusing it of being left-wing. But if I have a roughly equal number of comments in my inbox accusing me of being being a shill who was doing the bidding of my Jewish paymasters and accusing me of being a Hamas supporter or a Jew hater, then I, I'm fairly confident that we're getting everything exactly right. But the failure of the British media and possibly even the, quotes independent, end quotes, counter-terrorism advisor to the Home Office who's quoted widely in the media today to, to have a look at or to uh, display some knowledge of the background of the politician that Noga referred to, Itamar ben Gavir, is truly extraordinary, you know, particularly uh, you, you discussing the impact of phrases like from the river to the sea on, on, on banners or even on the lips of people protesting for peace in Palestine and, and the um, potentially genocidal ramifications of that phrase that many believe and many claim you have a look at what itamar ben gavir stands for currently the minister for, for for the security minister the head of the police ultimately in, in in israel and you'd understand why many people fear that the coverage we get in many corners of the uk media is is not really fair or balanced at all um 12 51 is the time I think I'll take a quick clip of full disclosure, actually, and then go back to the railway calls because it kind of ties in with what I've just said. This is a, a rare interview on full disclosure with a conservative politician. Actually, they're not that rare. We've had a few conservative politicians on, but I wonder if you can guess what they've all got in common. Rory Stewart has been on full disclosure. Well, no, actually, I think he was on the one I did before we launched full disclosure. No, he was on full disclosure. Longest pause you'll ever hear on a podcast when Rory Stewart came on full disclosure. In response, I think, to the question of whether or not he believed Boris Johnson to be dangerous. This is before Boris Johnson. Well, shortly after Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. Dominic Grieve has been on recently. Uh, who are they? What other Tories? Have we had other Tories on there? We, Ken Clark has been on full disclosure. Can you guess what they've all got in common? Uh, Michael Heseltine, I think, has been on full disclosure. I've certainly interviewed him a few times. And now Saeed Avasi, former chair of the Baroness Varsity to you, and, and one of the most enjoyable conversations with a politician that I've had in a very long time, and, and I generally enjoy all of them, but she had quite a lot to say. She's got her own podcast now out, which she does with, with David and David Badil called A Muslim and a Jew Go There. So it speaks to some of the stuff we've just touched upon in the context of what's happening in Israel at the moment. But here is a little taster of this week's full disclosure with Saeed Avasi. So mum and dad had always had different politics. Mum and dad, mum had always voted conservative. Dad had always voted Labour. So there was always a discussion in the house. And I think as I got older, I realised that for all the challenges that there were with the Conservative Party, um, and, you know, Enoch Powell still casts a dark shadow over most um, kind of Asian or black thinking on mm. the Conservative Party, that ultimately, if I thought about the way I wanted to live my life, the kind of... Uh, way in which I thought that my ideology was more centre right than it was centre left. Um, do I agree? Did I agree with everything the Conservative Party thought about at that point? No. Do I agree with everything they think about now? No. 
But why? You know, people think that they should agree with everything their party puts out. You, you could be married to somebody for 30, 40 years and still disagree with them on all sorts of things. You know, this is not, you're not married to this party. It's funny you say that. Because a caller said to me the other day on the, uh, talking about Starmer in a different context, using the marriage analogy in a slightly different way, they said, you don't have to marry him. You just have to recognise that he's driving the bus going in the direction that you want to go. There's going to be, you know, a million different people on that bus. But but it is about a broad sense of affinity rather than yeah. a football f- fan style loyalty to, yeah. a, to a party. That, my country, right or wrong, they do wrong. You know, my yeah. party does make mistakes. You mentioned Enoch Powell. Ted Heath threw him out. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I, I, there was a time when mainstream conservative politics would not allow extremists to hang around. Well, around you're preempting my next question, which is, do you think Rishi Sunak would have done? Oh, I, I think Rishi is no Ted Heath, right? And um, mm. in many ways, you kind of look back and think it should be easier for Rishi. I mean, one of the things that I, when Rishi became prime minister, I thought, this is hugely historic. The first prime minister of colour this country has ever had. And whatever you think of his politics, yeah. right or left, you got to celebrate that moment. I think what breaks my heart now is that tragically his tenure will be remembered as probably one of the most racist. And does he want to be the prime minister who presided over a party that was worse than it was during the, you know, during the kind of views that Enoch Powell had? Um, And he should clamp down on this, you know, if for no other reason, you know, if he looks back and thinks, well, you know, I'm not going to be in office in whatever five months time. Then you know, throw everything else of out you got now. To lose. Um, exactly. Other than just focus on your principles now. Make sure that th- stop trying to be what the right want you to be. Just be the decent centre ground conservative that I know he's capable of being. Twelve fifty five is the time. She didn't really answer the question, did she? I mean, if you're looking for a headline, there did Saeed Avasi say that Rishi Sunak wouldn't have thrown. He not pile out of the party? I'm not sure. I'll tell you what else is very interesting. Who do you think she blames for radicalising David Cameron? Remember, she, she was a senior member of David Cameron's cabinet. First Muslim woman, of course, to sit in a cabinet. Who do you think, which politician do you think she blames for radicalising David Cameron? That comes up in that full disclosure interview as well. Um, I may have time for two, but certainly one more call on railways. Graham is in Totnes. Professional or passenger, Graham? And, and what's going on? Uh, very much a passenger, but before I explain, James, I just want to say what a treat it is to hear your application of emotional intelligence. The way that you interview people, including on the Gaza issue just now, is just as extraordinary to hear. It's brilliant. Oh, um, thing last, to say. Thank you. Well, I've, I've thought that on more than one occasion when I've listened, and it's great to have the chance to explain it. But um, the last time we spoke, I referred to the privatisation of profit and the nationalisation of loss. Mm. It's a brilliant um, line. That, it's very true as well, isn't it? More so yeah, than ever. It, it, well, I think the trains explain it beautifully. The, the real problem I've got, being of a certain age now, I like to know, and living in the southwest, if I travel, it's likely to be a distance to the Midlands or to London. I want to know I've got a seat. Yes. Now, the big issue is the train companies are allowed to cancel the train up to 10 o'clock the day before, 10 o'clock at night, that is, the day before that you're travelling, and they suffer no penalty whatsoever as a result of doing that. So I can shell out a significant sum of money very happily, because I love travelling by train, with the promise that I'll have a reserved seat, only to find that the night before the train gets cancelled and I've got the train uh, that I was to have a seat on is no longer running. So the now, one you get on has that? no reservation, so you don't have you don't have the guarantee of a seat in the in the train that you finally get on. Yeah, we had that. We travelled up to London the weekend of the um, before the Queen's funeral. Oh yes, um, and, and we booked a. We went up by coach because there were no train seats, but we managed to book a train on the way back. And just before ten o'clock, the day before we were due to come back, the train was cancelled. Now, if you can imagine on a bank holiday type weekend no, in that sort of situation and you are you not entitled to a f- full refund in those circumstances but 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 of course you don't want a full refund you want to get to london in, in, indeed, I want to know that I can sit. No, just just one last thing on I this. haven't really got time. Real... I haven't got I'll tell you what Graham, let's leave them wanting more. Yeah? 
<laughs> you're a gentleman. No, you're, you're a gentleman, gentleman as well. That was a very kind thing that you said at the beginning of your call as well, not least because it meant that you didn't have time to finish the reasons that you'd actually rung in to talk about. So I, I don't know. Make of that what you will. Graham, God bless, mate. Take care. That's it from me for another day and indeed for another week. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.